Good afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you're joining us from today. I'm very pleased and honoured to welcome you to our session this afternoon as part of this UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development. It's been inspiring to see people join from around the world to discuss how we can implement education for the future in our different countries. My name is Rahema White. I'm joining you from Learning for Sustainability Scotland and University of St Andrews in Scotland, UK. Um, my, uh, we have um, Learn Learning for Sustainability Scotland is Scotland's uh, United Nations University Regional Centre of Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development. And we have over 900 individual and organisational members. We try to work across with our members and partners across schools, colleges and universities, but also with communities, with government and NGOs, drawing on our long-standing culture and practices in education for head, heart and hands. And we're proud that Scotland has made some advances in policy for education in sustainable development. However, today we are here to listen to the successes of countries around the globe in advancing policy for ESD. And this is one of the sessions on putting ESD into action at this conference. I want to start today by doing a poll and in this poll, we would like you to be able to, uh, to answer some questions. We are going to ask you a question. Which do you think is lacking the most in mainstreaming of ESD policy? So please feel free to vote for one of the following options. Do you think it's leadership or interministerial collaboration, intersectoral collaboration, local to national coordination, or public awareness. We all know that all of these are important, but I would be grateful if all of you could click on one of these options. While this poll is running, I'd like to explain the format we're going to have this afternoon. We have representatives from five different countries, from Peru, Kazakhstan, Namibia, Switzerland, Argentina, and each will share useful and replicable examples to promote and mainstream education for sustainable development in national education and sustainable development policies. After a short question from each, we will have a panel discussion and we would like the panel discussion to be based on further participation from yourselves, further questions. So do, whilst the talks are ongoing, submit questions for these um, through the Q&A optional box. The team will select these questions and we'll ask the speakers for their responses in a 30-minute panel at the end of the session. Okay, I hope you've all had an opportunity to fill in this first poll. So please, could we have the results of this poll? Very interesting. So we know that all of these things were important. And from yourselves, you thought that leadership was the most important of these, but only just Interministerial collaboration is also really important. It's so difficult to get connection across these different parts of government, but so was intersectoral collaboration. And keeping the public on side and uh, making sure that our citizens and our communities are involved is also important, as well as local national coordination. So thank you for that. Uh, and we'll bring that back in towards the end of the session. I'm now going to call on the first of our speakers today. And our first speaker today is uh, Ms. Sandra Soria Mendoza. She is the head of the Environmental Education Unit and Environmental Education Specialist, Peru. Ms. Soria Mendoza, please take the floor. Muchas gracias. Thank you Buenas so tardes con todos. Good afternoon. Nice to be here with you. Good afternoon to everyone for whom it is the afternoon and good morning to those where I am. At this World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development, I'd like to talk to you about environmental education in Peru and some of the challenges which we still face. 
you'll be aware of the considerable biodiversity that we have in Peru, but we're also especially vulnerable to climate change. For that reason, what I'd like to share with you today is some of the significant progress which we've achieved with inclusion of environmental education in the Peruvian education system. In the general law on education, we include in Article 8 and Principles of Education that uh, education regards the person as the center and fundamental agent of the educational process, including ethics, equity, inclusion, democracy, interculturality, and environmental awareness, which involves uh, caring for the environment as a fundamental principle. In 2012, we approved a national policy for environmental education as an instrument to develop environmental education and culture to lead to environmentally responsible citizenship and sustainable competitiveness. And in 2016, we moved forward to a national plan for environmental education as an instrument for public management, making environmental education operational. The idea here is that in, to include skills to, in education so that lifestyles can be more sustainable and healthy. We want citizens to be more involved in sustainable development at large. The third strategic axis is to increase institutional commitments to developing a more sustainable society. Another significant area of progress has been, if you could go one further with the slides. Thank you. Uh, including an environmental focus as one of the seven cross-cutting approaches that we have within our basic education curriculum. This was approved in 2016. These cross-cutting issues for basic education are values and attitudes for students, teachers, authorities for day-to-day -day life in school to bear these values in mind so that students develop their own learning process in a way which includes these values. And indeed, the teachers do too. This has an impact on behavior so that behavior uh, takes more account of the need to care for the environment. In terms of a cross-cutting approach to the environment, we have integrated environmental educational programs. This allows different skills and different cross-cutting approaches to be included with different values and approaches. In this way, we're mobilizing the entire educational community in such a way as to deal with specific environmental issues which have been identified and have an impact not only on educational establishments, but on society at large. And the Ministry of Education has developed various educational research uh, resources on environmental issues for the benefit of students and teachers. As time has passed, educational institutions have been developing a whole range of different integrated environmental programs. This has taken the form of good pr practice for environmental education. Uh, uh, an example which could inspire other educational establishments. COVID, of course, has had an impact on education and homeschooling was necessary in order for education to continue. There are various different programs from initial, primary, secondary uh, education, including environmental programs and learning schemes to respond to students' interests and needs, taking account of their context and mobilizing and developing further skills that will be necessary to their learning. This is some of the progress that we've achieved so that 
Students and teachers can help us tackle the climate crisis and the challenges which arise from it. Environmental awareness is at the heart of this. We are aware of the key role that environmental education can play to support sustainability so that we can live as far as possible in harmony with our planet. To conclude, we have a significant challenge ahead of us because we are updating our broad founding document, the Guide to National Policy, a vision for Peru for 2050, and a vision for the future of education in Peru at uh, the heart of sustainable development. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Ms. Soria Mendoza. It's very interesting to hear the, of the successes that you have made in Peru and uh, the way that you link your communities and your citizens and your schools together. We are now going to hear of another policy success, uh, which um, is coming from Kazakhstan. So I would like to offer the floor to Ms. Uh, Liazat Bulabayeva from the National Academy of Education, the Ministry of Education and Science in Kazakhstan. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rihina White. Uh Dear organizers and participants of the conference, I am pleased to welcome you today. I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for the invitation. My name is Lazar Bulibayeva. I represent the National Academy of Education, named after Ibrahim Altonsan of the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Kazakhstan. The Academy provides scientific and methodological support for the implementation of the public policy in the field of education in Kazakhstan and has 100 years of experience. Kazakhstan, slide next, please. Kazakhstan adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2015 and is actively working in all areas and is ready to contribute to the successful achievement of the global goals. The 2030 Agenda largely coincides with the country's priorities and was included in program documents such as Strategy of Development. Kazakhstan 2050, National Development Plan of Kazakhstan until 2025, Plan of Nations, 100 concrete steps or to implement the five institutional reforms, Ruhani Jangru program, 10 priorities of President Kazakhstan, and the national architecture for the uh, SDG has been created. The Coordination Council for the Sustainable Development Goals under the Government of the Republic of Kazakhstan has been established. The Council was created to develop proposals and recommendations for the promotion of the Sustainable Development Goals in the Republic of Kazakhstan. Priorities, tests and indicators. Uh, a quick and comprehensive assessment was carried out. About 79% of the SDG objectives are reflected in the documents of the state planning system of Kazakhstan. Organize the first forum on sustainable development within the framework of the Astana Economic Forum. Launch of the Sustainable Development Goals website. Uh, and the first voluntary national survey of Kazakhstan in 2019 was presented at the UN Forum. In order to achieve the goals of sustainable development in the field of education, the State Program of the Development of Education and Science for 2025 set out the objectives of ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. To achieve this goal, priority areas have been identified to ensure preschool training, the introduction of 12-year school education model, the development on, of 21st century skills among students, and equal access to affordable and high quality vocational technical education and higher education. According to the state program of the development of education and science, the main trends of updating the content of secondary education in the system of education are identified in which much, much attention is paid to transition from paradigm of person who knows, that is who owns a system of knowledge, skills and abilities 
to a person who is prepared for life. The second is uh, uh, to understand the need to move from the concept of education for life to concept to understand the need for lifelong learning education. The third, to uh, the, the, um, the understanding the need to develop initiative because initiative can guarantee success in life, mobility of person, his readiness to solve various problems from the formation, not only knowledge, but also competences. And um, last, the, uh, from knowledge to competences, the knowledge-centric model of education has long ceased to meet the real needs of the development of society and personality. Slide three, please. Uh, in order to synchronize the learning goals in the Catholic education system, we analyzed the World Bank and OECD documents as well as the theories of academic education educators and which were adopted uh, as the basis for the regulatory documents regulating the education system at all its levels for further integra integration of the SDG component into the learning process. The slide is presented on your screens, so I will not talk on them in details. Slide four, please. Uh, dear participants of the conference, on the slide you can see the goals, directions and what has been done to integrate the SDG component into the learning process. In particular, the following was performed. Uh, the analysis of uh, legal documents, state standards of education and achieved competences was carried out. Analysis of the content of standard training programs was carried out and uh, the next re the resources used in the learning process for standard learning programs are Analyzed. Second, uh, next please, slide five. Uh, the slide shows the structure of integrating the SDG standard component into the learning process. First, in the main document regulating the educational process in the educational organization, it is called the state mandatory standard of education. Changes have been made to the requir requirements for the level of training of students in educational areas. Secondly, in the standard curriculum for the subject, the goals and expected results of training in the subject are revised. Third, in the medium and short-term curricula, the learning objectives and expected outcomes by sections, topics, and quarters contain the main approaches outlined in the SDG uh, standards. Fourth, uh, criteria-based assessment system has been introduced. Slide six, please. The, um, you can see the classification and systematization of expected results were revised into line with the updated content of education. The criteria-based assessment system and covers functional literacy, creativity, and formation of literacy in reproductive health. The integration of SDG in the secondary education system is carried out across the entire vertical of the education system with the involvement of the Ministry of Education, uh, the National Academy of Education, 17 regional departments of education and methodological offices in their uh, 206 city and district methodological offices as well as managers, teachers and methodologists of 700 Five uh, seven thousand sorry five hundred educational organizations. Next, please. Um, implementation of the SDG component in the secondary education system covers students aged from one to eighteen years old, and is implement is implemented in the educational. Uh, components. It is reflected in the content of standard educational programs on physical culture, world knowledge, natural science, biology, chemistry, physics, history, self-knowledge, and etc. Through integration in cross-cutting teams, for example, in a healthy body, a healthy mind, food and drinks, environment. Based on the implementation of the preventive program, closer to each other further from bad habits. Integration of the healthy lifestyle component into educational programs of additional education. As you see, the Kazakhstan uh, is implemented SDG component in secondary education. 
So we are planning to revise the uh, school education program, secondary education program, uh, and to continue to implement SDG component in learning process. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Some really hard work uh, and uh, excellent examples of that given from Kazakhstan. We can see that you've managed to achieve some intersectoral collaboration with your SDG Council and there's real evidence of local to national collaboration as well as innovative pedagogies uh, and much more. Thank you for that uh, excellent example. Please, I wish, wish to remind the participants that you can submit questions for the panel discussion to the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. But now I would like to call on our next speaker. And Mr. Rod April is the Secretary General from Namibia National Commission for UNESCO in Namibia. Um, and I would like to ask you to take the floor and to tell us of the, what you have been doing there. Thank you very much. Moderator, it is an honor to join you and the other panelists during this discussion this afternoon. I also greet those who have joined us for this session. In my presentation, I would like to give the context on sustainability issues and ESD policy landscape and how Namibia is developing and ensuring policy adoption relevant to ESD. Uh, secondly, I'm going to share institutional collaboration and lastly, I will highlight some practical examples within some elements of mainstreaming in education and the sustainable development goals. On slide three, let me just briefly provide some context. You might be aware that Namibia by nature is a semi-arid country. We had faced both droughts and flooding in parts of the country, and these may persist in the future due to climate change. We are furthermore faced with deforestation, uh, poverty and, of course, unemployment, gender-based violence, poor waste management practices, to mention a few sustainability issues. COVID-19, as the first speaker also said, is the latest pandemic impacting Namibia educationally, socially, psychologically, and economically. Looking at these then, uh, moderator, panelists, and uh, wider viewers, Namibia has an approach to mainstream ESD policy on a national level instead of only within a ministry. This is achieved through a positive ESD policy landscape, ranging from the Constitution of the Republic of Namibia, especially Article 95, a long-term vision, uh, Vision 2030, to our short-term vision uh, of our national development plans and the Harambe Prosperity Plan. All these policies embrace the protection of the environment and aims to develop an environmental literate uh, society. In addition, Namibia has policies that deal specifically with sustainability issues, which are aligned with the SDGs. To give a few examples, these include climate change policy and action plan, water management related policies, human wildlife uh, conflict, uh, white paper on energy, agricultural policy, ministry of education policy and of inclusion education. And these are just a few examples. Now, each of these policies identifies education training and capacity building as a cross-cutting issue of sustainable development. On slide four, uh, just recently, and I should say this is the flagship on how we will chart, uh, uh, of course, 2030 ESD. Mm -hmm. Just recently, Namibia launched the National Environmental Education and ESD policy that makes Namibia the first country in SADC to have such a national standalone ESD policy. This policy was developed collectively through networking and institutional collaboration and was approved by cabinet. The vision of the policy is for an educated and empowered Namibia with env environmentally literate people taking responsibility and action for a sustainable future. It aims further at providing support and directives on how all sectors of society including, and this is important, non-formal and adult education can respond to ESD through mainstreaming. It was important that the Namibia also appoints and launches an interagency technical committee called the ESD Task Force that will ensure the implementation of and monitoring of the policy and finalize the ESD National Implementation Plan. Institutions and line ministries 
will establish EE or and ESD units, also uh, create sustainability offices and set key performance indicators, especially for monitoring and evaluation. Now, despite the positive policy landscape and the new opportunities that came with the national EE and ESD policy, Namibia has experienced some challenges in implementation of ESD at national level. Uh, uh, vis-a-vis lack of financial resources, lack of coordination of ESD-related activities, establishing partnerships, lack of quality programs, and limited research and innovation. In these challenging areas, the ESD task force will be instrumental to bring about positive changes. And then from an educational perspective on slide five, Uh, Just briefly, I have to emphasize that ESD is an integral part of the school curriculum in carrier subjects and a cross-curricular theme in other subjects across grades and phases. Schools such as the UNESCO Associated Schools Project have been advancing SDGs and they have transformed the school environment through knowledge, values and skill sharing with learners, teachers and parents through the whole school approach. Learners have also had an opportunity to expand their knowledge on field trips, uh, to example, ESD and research centers where they are involved in hands-on ESD activities. ESD has also been included in technical and vocational education and training, especially in the junior secondary and senior secondary revised curriculum, as this level is part of basic education. Further, the basic pre-vocational skills course for learners with special learning and educational needs and those with disabilities is mainstreamed since uh, 2016 already. In tertiary education, ESD had been included through the Sustainability Starts with Teachers project uh, from UNESCO, which focuses on SDG 4, climate action, uh, SDG 13, and on innovation and industrialization. Modules on ESD in the Bachelor of Education curriculum are also offered. And lastly, non-formal and adult adult education have, through diverse courses, provided knowledge and skills required for managing natural resources in a way that causes no significant damage to the environment. They offer courses that raise awareness and equip community members with the skills and resilience needed to combat the effect of climate change through appropriate mitigation and adaptation methods. These education uh, promote sustainable lifestyles, for example, in managing human and wildlife conflict through community-based natural resources management. Now, finally, um, I would like, just like to repeat that ESD requires a national approach. And I believe that through the ESD task force, institutional mainstreaming nationally can be further enhanced for maximum awareness, knowledge, values, and skills development and behavioral change. Uh, for this, I thank you. For listening. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. April. Um, a, a real example of what can be done, and uh, it's, it's fantastic to hear of your achievements um, down in, in uh, the SADC region. A really nice example of interministerial collaboration there, as well as local national coordination, and also with your adult education definitely linking into public awareness. So touching on many of the essential aspects of policy for ESD there. After that inspiring example, we're moving on to a different part of the world, and I would like to invite Ms. Dominique Rieschen to take the floor. Uh, uh, Ms. Rieschen is the Advisor for Education for Sustainable Development of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation of Switzerland. We look forward to hearing what you've been achieving in your nation. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the discussion on ESD still tends to focus on environmental aspects. This is also apparent in the conference. However, it is crucial to pay equal attention to social and economic outcomes of well-being. And several states have also observed that they have not yet succeeded in creating a cross-sectoral understanding of ESD and in engaging all relevant state actors and stakeholders in a coordinated approach. So this is our motivation today to share Switzerland's um, experience in promoting a 
ESD as a holistic concept through a whole of government approach. Um, so what do we mean by a holistic concept? ESD addresses the interrelationship between the society, the environment, the economy, and the individual. At the heart of ESD is the promotion of transversal competencies that are necessary to cope with global challenges and to shape the future in a more sustainable way. And these competencies are transversal in the sense that they apply in and across a wide range of areas. So for instance, they enable learners to creatively engage with a complex and globalized world that involves multiple values, contradictions and uncertainties, and to act with foresight and responsibility. Sustainable, sustainability relevant topics including environmental issues and climate change, but also democracy and human rights, intercultural understanding, global development, health and consumption. These are important thematic entry points for teaching and learning such competencies. ESD is an educational concept that can be used across all subjects and educational levels. And finally, ESD is also a principle to organize a school as a sustainable place to learn, to teach, and to share. Uh, please, next slide. Switzerland is a federal and multilingual country with a decentralized education system of 26 cantons responsible for compulsory education and general education. In the context of the UN decade for ESD and the harmonization process of compulsory education, several federal offices and the highest education authority of cantons, that's the Conference of Cantonal Ministers of Education, they have joined forces to anchor ESD as part of the curriculum reform. At the same time, they recognized the need for a national competence center to support the implementation of ESD in Switzerland's federal education system. And therefore, in 2012, public funds invested in specialized foundation uh, in the area of development cooperation, of environment, of health promotion were pooled in order to create such a national ESD competence center. So the result of this coordinated effort is that ESD is now part of the public education mandate, it is integrated in the three language regional curricula for compulsory education. And currently seven federal offices and the cantons are committed to mainstreaming ESD as an integrated concept with a whole of school approach with the support of the National ESD Competence Center called Education 21. Uh, next slide, please. We consider the promotion of ESD in Switzerland as a success story. So what have been uh, conducive factors? First, the, consider the consideration of the federal structure of Switzerland through the creation of the National ESD Competence Center with the national ministries funding the center and the cantonal ministries supporting the implementation of ESD in all schools. Second, the anchoring of ESD as a cross-curricular concept in the curricula, but also in teacher training and further education. So this means there is no separate school subject ESD, but integration of ESD in all existing curriculum subject. Third, the involvement of the relevant educational stakeholders in the foundation of the competence center. This includes representatives of the cantons, of teachers and principals, Polls associations of teacher colleges, of the employees association, and also of NGOs. Fourth, the consistent orientation of didactics and methodologies to the multi-perspective ESD approach instead of only uh, one-dimensional approach. Is, for instance, only the environmental approach or only the social development perspective. 
and the integration of topics such as gender and equality, democratic values, human rights, and health. And last but not least, the inclusion of the whole of school approach, namely the understanding of schools as learning organizations that themselves make a concrete contribution to their sustainable development. And in this way, ESD becomes also tangible for students at the action level. And on this particular topic, please visit our live session tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock. And to conclude, for Switzerland, this multi-level approach to ESD has proven to be effective and a good way forward to mainstream ESD. And we hope that with this example, we can inspire others to engage in a more holistic approach to ESD. Over to you, Rima. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very another very inspiring example, this time from Switzerland, and with the focus on not not only environmental, but also social and economic issues, you've had to explore a cross-sectoral understanding of ESD uh, and, and to pursue this. So that's a very nice example of how that has been undertaken. Thank you for this. So um, I would just like to remind our audience that you can submit and uh, still submit a question under the Q&A section on the bottom of the screen. And we're going to start moving now to the panel discussions. But at the beginning of the panel discussion, we have uh, one more speaker who I would like to bring in to say a few words. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Dr. Eugenio Gonzalez Perez, uh, Vice Minister of the Republic of Cuba, to uh, speak and to, to give us a few words first. Thank you. Yeah. Over to you. The Republic of Cuba shares the UNESCO focus on the right development of fundamental human race and a basis for peace and sustainable development. We therefore adopting the role as a vanguard in education for sustainable development as the fourth pillar of priorities in education to promote the object of sustainable de development. And there we have to address the learning environment and the abilities of our teachers. We reaffirm our compromise our commitment to education for sustainable development to address climate change, which is uh, an urgent task that needs to be addressed given the data we have and its effect on our country. We have to inter implement measures to address the impact, bearing in mind that Cuba is a small country in development following the UNESCO priority to address policies that will provide education for sustainable, sustainable development. And in, with a view to that, the country has included um, education for sustainable development in the new curriculum for national education and in the materials provided. It's also included in educational work with families to raise awareness of risks and dangers and to increase the participation of all people in addressing climate change. The focus is placed on climate change, its effects in all sorts of parts of the country, in the mountains, in the plains, towards the coast, addressing the sensible use of energy and preservation of our ecology. Ladies and gentlemen, we're faced with growing challenges and Cuba has addressed its schools to promote education in sustainable development with the inclusion of families and other social actors and online tools. Education is provoked, provided at a high quality, free and comprehensively. In the course of the pandemic, Cuba has continued its initiatives in learning to live and 
trying to address the problems of our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we really are very grateful to that intervention from, from Cuba. And again, a fantastic example of how the uh, educational sector is working very closely with families and with the public to uh, support learning for education, uh, learning and education for sustainable development and responses to climate change. I would, would like to thank all of the speakers for their uh, presentations and we are now going to shift to the panel discussion and um, we are going to, to have some questions which have come in from the audience. So to the speakers, I'm going to start with two questions which are for everyone. So I'll ask you one by one if you have a particular response to this question um, and then we will move on to some specific questions for, for individual speakers as well. The first question to you is that uh, one of the main objectives of creating a policy is that uh, citizens do not always share the same understanding and the same language regarding the topic of interest. So in your country, does the entire educational community share the same vision of education for sustainable development? That's your students, your teachers, your administrative uh, staff, your communities. If they do not share the same vision, how have you managed to ensure that everybody involved can take ownership of the policy and make it their own? So this is a question around uh, creating or, or supporting a shared vision of ESD so that you can move forward. And I will ask you in, in order. So please, uh, Ms. Soria Mendoza, would you like to respond first to this question? Thank you. Yes, I was listening to the questions and reading them with great interest. In the Ministry of Education in Peru, what we're doing is implementing a series of actions to raise awareness. And these actions include a series of strategies. When we had face-to-face -face classes, when we had that opportunity, we held face-to-face -face events. With the pandemic, what we've had to do is devise and design strategies that could take these ideas out to our teachers. We have asynchronous virtual resources focusing on staff and teachers to show how environmental education can be included in the overall teaching curriculum in general practices. It's worked well, we've had significant participation. A lot of teachers have got involved, but unfortunately, these training initiatives still haven't reached as far as they could. It's a major challenge, but we do hope that they have the potential to have a multiplier effect, to reach out to more and more people. And we work in very close collaboration with other sectors, with other departments in government, in order to ensure that we are strengthening the environmental education dimension of our general education. Muchas gracias, uh, Ms. Uh, Soria Mendoza. I, I'm going to ask if uh, anybody else in the uh, panel would like to answer, ask this one, or otherwise we will move on to the next question. Would anybody else particularly like to ask how you have explored a shared vision for education for sustainable development? Yes, I would like just to come in quickly, okay. uh, Rima. 
Okay, I'll have, I'll have Rod, uh, Mr. April, and then Dominique. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I will be very I will be very brief because the question is very very relevant, because it will also be very difficult to have this cohesion, uh, cohesion and a full understanding from all your citizens, or maybe on a scale of a percentage to go to one hundred percent. But uh, in Namibia, we are driven by, as I said in my presentation as well, uh, through the through the con constitution in in Article ninety five. Uh, uh, that, that that guides that guides our Namibian citizens because we have also seen that uh, uh, in the past we have had lots of fragmented implementation from very buried uh, institutions, organizations, and so on. And that is why it was so important to establish this task force and that the next steps would be that uh, this policy will now be rolled out to all the regions. That is the next steps of the implementation plan that the task force will do. It will now be rolled out to all the regions, the 14 regions across Namibia to, 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 to get more uh, an understanding and, and raise more an awareness am among, the, among the citizens. So this is just briefly that I wanted to share with, uh, with the rest of the team. Many thanks for that. So we have an example from Peru of, of virtual teacher resources and activities. We have an example from Namibia where the task force is able to take these discussions out and to engage people. Ms. Uh, Reichen, would you like to talk about uh, what, what Switzerland has been doing with this regard? Um, I think what is important is uh, that we have uh, that we achieved a public education mandate and the integration in the curriculum, but that's not sufficient. So it was also important for creating a common understanding to have um, ESD integrated in the teachers' training and further education. So that's one thing to have this common understanding, this holistic understanding, but then to implement it in the schools with the teachers, then we still have a way, uh, a way to go. And here's place uh, our National Competence Center, a key role by preparing specific ESD, um, uh, spe ESD specific uh, materials, tools uh, that are easily uh, used, easily uh, can be easily used by teachers and in schools. I think it's a combined approach um, to move from, let's say, from the discourse to the practice. Many thanks. It's always difficult implementing policy and getting these visions out. Thank you. Our second question is relates to how young people um, are responding. And the question is, how can the upcoming generations be involved in the development processes of ESD? So how do we get youth involved? And I'm going to, first of all, ask if uh, Ms. Bulabayeva can, uh, can address this question, please, from Kazakhstan. Would you like to respond first to this? Sorry. Uh, recently, uh, the Kazakhstan developer system um, to uh, we, we are going to analyze the learning programs in secondary school uh, according of uh, components of SDG which allows to monitor the process of implementing the SDG standards in uh, educational process, in the learning process. So uh, it is very interesting uh, because uh, we are, as I said, uh, we are going to, uh, to develop, to create the new model of uh, 12 levels uh, secondary education in Kazakhstan. We, we are going to, uh, to make new model. So, uh, it is very important to, uh, to have, uh, full information, uh, of, uh, implementing the component of stand, uh, sustainable development goals in the learning process, in the 
learning process, uh, achievements, uh, critical assessment and uh, resources, and etc. Many thanks. Thank you for that Thank response. You. I would like to know if uh, Dr. Gonzalez Perez from the Republic of Cuba, would you like to respond to this question? The question is, how do we get youth involved in these plans and in the implementation of ESD? Sí, yeah. sí muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you. As we know, um, ESG is part of Cuba government policies, so there's a multi-sectoral approach. Students associations, local people, um, government association, so there's active participation of all involved in education in the project, so it includes information for teachers, pedagogical assistance to them to make sure that they're able to um, provide practical solutions respecting the nature of our country and our different territories and address young people in the right way. It's important to make sure that we have proper instruction for teachers at all levels and training for them and that we take solutions coming from science to apply them in a practical, integrated and differentiated way to address each of the individual problems based on the geographic nature, nature of the different parts of our country. So we have these young people involved in the um, design of the curriculum and implementation. It's they who are learning to um, live and it, there's a lot of incentive for them to be involved. And we address them through television, through um, social networks, and uh, how, try to get them involved in providing the solutions available in the Cuban educational system to uh, inf give them an opportunity to influence what's happening in the educational system. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Many, thank you. Many thanks indeed uh, for, for that. We also had a question from somebody who is at a university. So I think we'll, we'll maybe move on to the next question. But this was in particularly to remember that our university students are wanting to be involved and to be involved in the design of pol policy. So I now have a question, uh, mm. two questions for specific individuals. I have a question Anima? for, yeah. May I just come in just yes. very briefly on the previous question? Yes, Mr. <laughs> because the youth is the dividend, and I need to say something on this just briefly, <laughs> very quickly. The youth is a dividend of Africa. You know, we are a youthful continent. So we need to draw on the experience and the present thinking of the youth. And that is what, mm -hmm. what do they like? You know, I'm not so good at ICT and internet, but I think that they come together and they create their own uh, grassroots grassroot hubs like internet. And then uh, what the previous speaker as well said in terms of in terms of teaching, the teaching strategies from the teacher to the youth element to draw them in in innovative practices so that they can see the future that uh, they are they are moving towards because they must protect the life that we have. Uh, so, so innovative uh, teaching and learnings, awareness raising more on them, uh, activities that they can be drawn into that they like ICT, uh, games, and, and just the hubs of internet. That is what I would briefly like to say on this one. Thank you, Mr. April. I, I totally agree. I think the, 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 the youth are, of course, the future and how we engage them is really critical, not just in implementing, but also in designing policy for ESD. I have a question specifically for you as well, please, in Namibia. And the question uh, that was asked is, is it, is it difficult or was it difficult to convince non-formal education institutions that ESD is something that directly concerns them? in Namibia. Would you please talk on, on your experiences there? You know, in, in, in non-formal education, we do not have 
uh, specific curricula on ESD. But on ESD, integration is through diverse, uh, diverse courses. I'm not the competent authority to speak on adult education, but in my, in my knowledge, the, the integration of ESD within adult education makes them aware within the community and through the courses that they offer that they have a, an environmental responsibility. It is not always easy also to draw in the adults, but it is within the teaching approach. One element of mainstreaming uh, is the, the issue of, of methods of how we teach these adults as well, because they must know that they must link the content with the environment and where they are so that they can also create sustainable lifestyles. And this is what we have seen in Namibia, that, uh, that especially with the challenge that we have between uh, human wildlife conflict and so on, that adult education courses, they help through the community-based natural resources management. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very interesting example through community-based natural resource management and uh, human wildlife conflict uh, management processes. The idea of these competencies and capacities that the that the wider public and uh, the communities can can strengthen. I have a question specifically for Ms. Reichen now in Switzerland. And the question that was asked by the, the audience is, what have been the main challenges in Switzerland to implement this comprehensive model of ESD? I think the idea of there of combining the uh, environmental along with the economic and the social aspects that you spoke about. Thank you very much for the question. So the main challenges are, have been, uh, on the one hand, to deal with a federal system of education, um, three language regions, um, cantons that are responsible for, for compulsory education, um, and recognizing that we have to be more effective by um, going beyond silos. So I think... Um, as I said uh, during my presentation, the UN decade for ESD was sort of an impetus uh, to critically reflect on the situation. And at the same time, um, the harmonization process that was needed in, uh, in, this, uh, in Switzerland's edu federal education system. So these two momentums created um, also the willingness and the recognition that we need to join forces. And I think um, um, this, this is quite, and also the fact that, uh, for instance, the Swiss Agency for Development, for which I work, we found, founded a foundation specifically, uh, education foundation spe specifically for development cooperation and the uh, Ministry of Environment, they funded a, um, a foundation specifically on environmental education and the same for the uh, health uh, ministry. And in this context, there was this recognition that this is not the way forward, that we needed a, a more holistic and more integrated approach. And they and that's what I also said during my presentation. They agreed to, to stop, to, to, to put those, to merge those foundations and to create a new center by pooling the, the, uh, the, the, the funds, the public funds. I think that's sort of the, maybe more the reaction to the challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much for that response. And uh, I think that leads us very nicely onto our next question. And our next question is about resource mobilization. And I will ask each of you this in turn. So if each of you could respond quite briefly to this big question. The question is that putting policy into practice requires resource allocation, especially by government, to ensure that uh, implementation plans can be successfully rolled out from policy. How was this made possible in the success stories we have had? So how, how did you manage to achieve the resource mobilization to develop and then implement and roll out your policies? So I would like to start, please, with uh, Ms. Uh, Soria Mendoza. Please, uh, uh, in Spanish, I know, I know Spanish. Would you like me to go to someone else first? 
please. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll start then, please, with uh, Ms. Uh, Bulabayeva. Would you like to respond to how you managed to mobilize resources mm -hmm. uh, to implement your policies? Um, in Kazakhstan, we have no the special uh, resources, the special program for uh, which um, which uh, uh, include uh, the um, financial resources to uh, implement the SDG standards. But uh, we have, as I said, uh, the state government program of education for 20 uh, for next five years and the, uh, of course the development of standards and programs in uh, secondary education the curriculum is funded by the state budget uh, when uh, we uh, developed the uh, documents and um, the resources, for example, books and learning resources, uh, which includes the content of SG, 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 ESG. Of course, uh, the, um, uh, we, we, uh, we um, take the uh, support from uh, government uh, to uh, to uh, which we use in uh, in um, development of uh, uh, learning resources. Thank you for that. Uh, could I could I move on to Mr. April, please? In in Namibia, was, was do you have any tips to share with the audience here for how to mobilize resources for your successes? Rehima, yes, uh, thank you very much. You know that uh, reflecting on my presentation, I indicated as a matter of fact, resource mobilization as a challenge. And resource mobilization is one of the goals uh, of the EESD uh, national policy that we launched. Uh, but we know that our government in the Republic of Namibia uh, gives a high percentage of the budget to to, to education. And part of that budget is also uh, used for ESD activities or whatever old school uh, approaches that they have in, in, in the sector of education, whether it is now at uh, uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary level. But for the rollout of the policy, we have secured funds. You know, UNESCO has what they call the participation program. And for the rollout of this whole e e ESD policy, some of these funds, the resources from uh, that budget will then be used for the rollout. So that is just one tip that I can give also for member states uh, belonging to uh, UNESCO. I'm sure UNESCO will be getting plenty of applications for that fund just now. Thank you. Could I ask uh, Dr. Gonzalez Perez? Uh, would you like to respond with some examples of resource mobilization? Sí, muchas gracias. Como ya hemos explicado, el led As we said, this is part of um, state policy. So actions directed to mitigating uh, this phenomenon and for education in this are part of state policy and they're included in the allocation of response, the resources. They're addressed in the budget, which doesn't just address the implementation of the policy, but also follow up and monitoring of education for sustainable development in different parts of the state where central authorities are involved and assist the regional authorities in uh, implementation. Projects have been financed, starting at uh, scientific projects in our universities, um, educational authorities in uh, the regions, and the state has financed this uh, research as well to address the vulnerabilities faced by current and future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Soria Mendoza, would you, would you like to respond briefly to the resource mobilization question? In the Peru, 
In Peru, in terms of having actions to mobilize the educational community and other stakeholders in civil society, and indeed the state itself, I'd say this is within the policy documents that are published. This is part of the educational institution's role. It goes from identifying difficulties and problems in the environmental field, also opportunities. And it then goes through a series of strategies for implementation. So that does involve mobilization of the entire educational community. So along those lines, what we do from the Ministry of Education is make a contribution in terms of providing resources so that we can issue guidelines, make a toolkit available so that actions will be possible, so that actions will be interconnected and to support the work which is done for the benefit of students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, some very interesting responses. We're going to start rounding up now. So we have the last couple of questions and we're going to come back to the poll that we had at the very beginning where the audience identified that one of the issues they have uh, had challenges with around um, the development of, of policy for, ES, for mainstreaming ESD is leadership. And so I would like to ask the panelists if somebody would like to respond how they manage to uh, achieve the leadership to be able to, to pursue successfully the policies in ESD that you have talked about. Would anybody like to, to address that? Mr. Richard, yeah. Um, after the implementation of ESD in Switzerland, we have a, a coordination group uh, consisting of all the uh, federal offices, by now there are like seven or eight, and we coordinate positions with regard to uh, national policy, but also uh, with regard to international policy. That's one thing. We have uh, an interaction, close interaction with this competence center, uh, Education 21, that is funded by now by or supported by seven different um, by seven different um, federal offices. So I think, uh, on behalf of the, the 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 national ministries, but also the cantons, there is clear commitment uh, to to continue to mainstream ESD. So this is broadly accepted, broadly um, promoted. And I, so I would say, yes, there is leadership and it is important. Thank you for that example. Would anybody else particularly like to talk about leadership in their countries and how that has led to the success stories that you have described? Let me ask this question. Sorry, uh, Mr. Rotapril. We'll ah, take you okay. first. You may uh, proceed. Uh, yeah. You may proceed, uh, Lizette. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rod April. Uh, of course, the leadership is the main uh, aspect of implementing the SDG standards of learning process, and that I think, uh, as uh, on, uh, according to my experience, the teacher. Uh, is very uh, main person who demonstrate the leadership. Uh, the teacher is, uh, is a, a person who will who will able to implement uh, the ESG standards in learning process. For example, uh, the topics, uh, the, the content. Uh, who will make uh, classes and uh, can uh, can implement uh, component of ESG in different subjects. For example, uh, 
geography or local history or knowledge of the world, uh, which will uh, the topic uh, in uh, different levels of education in secondary education. And uh, the main uh, the the main role of the um, teaching at school uh, we can see uh, every day uh, during his classroom during his job. Uh, so I think the teacher is the global and the main person who will will able to implement and to. Um, to integrate the component of ESG, ESG in learning process in secondary school. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's lovely to hear that the teachers are being called the leaders and not just the policy makers. It's the teachers in schools who have to put this forward. Uh, Mr. April, did you want a last word on leadership? I know you wanted to come in just now. Yeah, and this will be very briefly. We have seen, we have seen even before the ESD 2030, with the last decade of ESD 2009 and uh, 2014, that that leadership was really taken by by the main ministry of education, uh, arts and culture. What we what we see now in Namibia also with the development and the launch of of the policy, we have leadership. It was adopted by cabinet. So you have you have uh, the uh, political will as well to drive within the constitution. Um, then furthermore, also by the custodian of this policy is the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism. So you have also what the previous speaker says, your micro leadership among the learners who and the teachers and so forth. So this these micro leadership initiatives, we also need to appreciate them. But what we should actually ask ourselves now in the current in terms of the 21st century is what is the status of transformative leadership? Because we have lots of challenges, especially now with COVID-19, education disrupted and so forth. So we are talking about, and this is the challenge that we have, and that is what we need to look at, transformative leadership, doing things a bit differently and maintaining also uh, ESD practices, new behavioral changes and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have uh, we had some other questions which we did not have time to address. But for the for yourselves and for the audience, the audience also wanted to know how we are going to monitor and follow up, particularly SDG four point seven, how the, how our countries are including lifelong learning policies for ESD, how how what role distance learning might play in ESD, particularly after our experiences with the COVID nineteen pandemic. And what we should do at international level to promote ESD and action in countries. So we have a number of interesting questions and I hope we will keep this debate alive further as well. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, do you also wish to uh, answer this, this question on leadership before we finish? Sí, muchas gracias. No solo significar Thank que... you. Leadership is not just a matter of public policy, it's a matter of um, preparation of uh, people in the sector. It's a matter of many people carrying out uh, experimentation and developing um, good practice. The plan for social and economic development of our country includes ESD. Uh, objectives. So it includes a lot of sectors of the population, including the civil society, in the search for solutions. So they too are leaders in this great ballot battle. And I'd emphasize the positive role of UNESCO in developing institutions associated with UNESCO and the way they've made it possible for um, educators and families to become protagonists in the process. It's not just a matter of uh, financing, it's an integrated, holistic approach on a continuous basis, looking for appropriate solutions on a permanent basis, addressing the different characteristics of different places. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And that is a lovely point on which to finish our conversation today. The idea that we need leadership at an international level with our organizations such as, as UNESCO, as well as within our national places, within our ministries, so that we can support interministerial collaboration, as well as in our schools with our teachers and also from the youth themselves and with the communities outside there as well. So I'm going to finish with one or two suggestions. Please would people uh, and join the UNESCO ESD LinkedIn group to share more examples, publications and policy success stories. And the address is in the chat just now. But I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their inspiring and useful talks today. I hope we can take away some lessons to deepen and widen our policy for ESD and our national and sustainable education and sustainable development policies. If we think back to our poll at the beginning, we remember we collectively felt that all of these things were important. Leadership, interministerial and intersectoral collaboration, local national coordination and engaging the public, engaging our citizens and our communities. And I think you've shown how these are all important to support ESD mainstreaming. Everybody here had a passion to support transformative learning and action for a fairer and greener world, one that is not just worrying about environment, but also concerned about integrated aspects of society and economics. So let us take this decision today and act on it. Thank you for listening and for your questions. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the fantastic organizing team. Take care and goodbye. So we can start the session. Thank you. Welcome to the session, Transforming the Learning Environment and um, the session 9.2. So Claudia, can I use my PowerPoint? Yes, excellent. So once again, welcome. My name is Miho Taguma, and it's an honor for me to moderate this session with great panelists. So I'm a senior policy analyst at the OECD. I'm currently leading the OECD's project, The Future of Education and uh, Skills 2030. And this session is really about taking the ES ESD into action and looking at the learning environment and how to make change happen. And as we all know, this is not one person's job. It takes the whole school and whole village to make it happen. Therefore, we have a variety of speakers with a lot of different backgrounds. You will get to see them in a minute. But before this, my job is to set the scene for that. And I would like to take this opportunity to share with you some of the OECD's analysis on curriculum. And it really shows a lot of challenges ahead of us, but our panelists can share with us some of the solutions to these challenges. And out of many challenges, I would like to focus on two aspects. So one is, when we see this theme, transforming learning environment, let us not forget about well-being because learning and well-being is so closely related. And we have witnessed during this COVID pandemic how children need secure and safe space for their learning. So let us not separate learning and well-being. And in a minute, I will show you some intriguing OECD analysis, how we need to make conscious efforts to think about it. So one key word is well-being. And the second is authentic learning. So transforming learning environment, but that learning has to be authentic. It should not be like a bookish learning, but authentic learning. So two key words from me, well-being and authenticity. So for the well-being, let me introduce you to one intriguing 
PISA result, because learning includes not only learning in school, but learning out of school too. And if we see, okay, the more learning is better, we can anticipate the school points per hour productivity of learning can be in line with this learning. But evidence suggests the other way around. <laughs> so the more learning in some countries on the right, productivity is actually lower. So students can learn deeper and the quality of learning time matters because all the curriculum designers are struggling. ESD is very important, but they are often um, facing the competing other subjects, financial literacy after financial crisis, programming, coding, and um, the computational thinking after the big buzz about the R AI, artificial intelligence, big data, and the internet of things and blockchain and so on. Media literacy after fake news or deeper fake news. And entrepreneurship education after AI is taking over the jobs and kids need to create their jobs. So ESD is placed as a competition with other themes and it's easier to add on, but it's very important that the curriculum should not be over expansion, over curriculum overload because students, child um, student and child well-being is at risk of this curriculum expansion. Another key um, takeaways from our analysis is how can we make it authentic? And ESD is often related to many different learning areas, disciplinary areas. For example, some countries link it to more like a national language. Other countries link it to mathematics. ESD is related to mathematics. Other countries link it to humanities and some others link it to home economics and technologies. Some others to art, some others um, PE, physical education and health. Countries make different choices. And it is okay to make different choices because each school has different culture and different resources around the school. So there's no one size fit all solutions to make authentic learning. So these are the two takeaways from OECD analysis. So please do remember two keywords from me as scene setting. One is well-being. Another one is authenticity in learning. So that's my input. And this is just to show you audience a wide range of great panelists. I had the pleasure to speak all of them prior to this, and they have rich experience. And Jinan from the school principal perspective, and Nasuka, the teacher perspective, and Nuda as a teacher trainer, and Sofiane as a school network and the coordinator, and Angelica, um, Angie, uh, from policymaker perspective. So it's going to be a very rich discussion. But the audience, you are the participants as well. So please do not sit back and just listen to us, but please participate through either putting your questions in the chat box so that I can pick up some of your questions and ask the panelists. And also in a minute, we will invite Claudia to share with you the Zoom poll so please do show your perspectives as well. So Claudia, it's the time for audience to show what their thinking are at the beginning before they listen to the panelist. So the question is very simple. Which element do you think is the most important in implementing ESD as a whole school initiative? So the panelists cannot participate because if we do, it will close down the poll, unfortunately. So let us wait for a minute for participants to answer this.
And Claudia, I think you can see how many people responded and when you think it's ready to show the result. Uh, we count on Claudia to show us the result. And while waiting, I would like to thank Claudia and Kohei and Jim Morahashi, who is not here, and also Alexandra, who is also not here, but OECD has been closely collaborating with the UNESCO team and ESD team. So we are very grateful for the cooperation. Okay, so the result shows the 29% around one third thinks it's school governance and more than half of you think it's really teaching and learning curriculum, pedagogies and assessment. And no one actually chose facilities and operations. And about 20% said community partnership. Okay, that's great. So now we get to hear the more micro perspective in all of the three topics that the audience have chosen in different ways. So there's no one size um, uh, solution or one answer. We are all thinking together to explore this question. So first, can I invite Jinan from Lebanon to start to kick off the, um, your introduction first? Then I will ask you a question. So please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Miho. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here uh, in this great conference. I'm Jinan Karami Shaya, a uh, school principal at Manar Modern School in Lebanon. I have a PhD in Education for Sustainable Development and a long journey implementing ASD in my teaching practices and in my leadership uh, journey uh, as a principal. And I hope you would uh, really enjoy my presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Then Gina, let me ask you for your presentation, the focus is really in order to fully implement ESD in your action. What kinds of changes, what kind of transformations do you think are necessary in your current learning environment? And how did you make those changes happen? How did you make the miracle to make it happen? Please. Thank you. Uh, October 2019 was the spark where we faced cumulative inconveniences on different levels in Lebanon. Protests, economic crisis, pandemic, and the worst of all was Beirut explosion. These inconveniences developed learners to feel insecure and lose their confidence with the governance system and the effective implementation of peace and justice. And here comes our question about the most effective education that should be delivered within this context and how we can implement it. Through ESD Lens, we set the profile of the active citizen that our country needs to develop sustainably. We should develop an active citizen who is well knowledgeable with a deeper understanding of sustainable norms and values, a critical thinker who can evaluate the context based on sustainable development norms, a good researcher who is able to collect valid and reliable data, an innovator, problem solver, and social entrepreneur who can create sustainable solutions, model them, and have project management skills to implement in real life, and a value-based leader who, through regular self-reflection evaluation and the strive for greater self-awareness, can influence others, plan strategically, and do effective partnerships for implementing sustainable solutions and development awareness campaigns. Having set our vision, the planning for the implementation has started. Curriculum content, although governed by national and international standards, we believe should be shaped by the context. That's why we adopted understanding by design approach to design our unit plans based on happenings to equip learners with all their needs to overcome the current context at different levels, including personal. The unit plans definitely involve inquiry-based e-learning instructional designs with the most effective technologies, 
problem-oriented performance tasks or projects, including STEM, learning activities that deepen students' understandings, uncover perspectives, develop empathy, and reinforce 21st century skills, and authentic action-oriented assessment that on, not only do they measure students' knowledge and skills, but also enhance their attitudes through decision-making processes and personal reactions towards the context. Moreover, a genuine entrepreneurship course for secondary classes was developed where students made their own business plans by the end of the year. Consequently, we induced a multidisciplinary ESD approach where all subject teachers deal with the same context but from their subjects' perspectives. A wellness club was developed for kindergarten students and many other activities for different classes were done to reinforce social emotional skills and well-being and advocacy. Knowing that the implementation was remotely done and considering that some families with more than one student were using one device, we designed our daily schedule based on research done investigating the availability of devices with the students so that students with siblings will never have online classes at the same time. We made awareness webinars to parents where we invited experts from different fields to guide them in developing daily routines to help them manage their anger and be more resilient. Please, can you move the slide next? During our implementations, we have noticed that our students were not autonomous learners. So we've started coaching sessions with low achieving students to help them set their goals, to develop and reinforce different executive function skills to master their learning journey. And a few months ago, we started our partnership with an amazing initiative, Transformation Lebanon where we got introduced to the global priority solutions, values, and the roundtable strategy to reinforce value-based leadership. This simple but grand tool ignites the self-evaluation of daily practices of values of connection, listening, restraint, self-esteem, forgiveness, hope, and compassion. So I created three virtual clubs in my school, one for students, one for alumni students, and one for parents. And we are doing weekly three to four virtual roundtables to reinforce the values within the whole school community. And now, as a result of our school experience, we have started to help other schools in this training, and one of them was a school for special needs students. Having mentioned all this ESD, has shaped all our school's educational plans and strategies to be more effective and serve the main goal of education, developing an active citizen, and it wasn't at all an extra load. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dinan. Your stories are full of wisdom. And I can see that some of the key uh, pedagogies and approaches found in OECD countries are resonate. So from your story that you mentioned that all subject teachers work together and the design with the student. So now I wonder these aspects are how can these aspects be understood and supported by teachers? So now let us ask Asuka for your own uh, teacher perspective with the school leaders thinking like Jinan. So in your school, is it the well understood or supported concept that all teachers need to work together? And what can we do that where some Teachers may be a bit reluctant than others. And also, how can you involve student voice in the whole design? So maybe we can get some tips from you to what Gina shared with us. Asuka, please. Okay, you can hear? Very good. So for the audience, yeah. for your information, Asuka is staying out for late for us. So in Japan, it's in the middle of the night, but he, she is with us with the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Asuka, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Asuka Inoue. I teach in, in mainly geography in Japanese school. 
And I'm working on a learning plan for the SDGs or ESD in school. I'm still learning about the SDGs. I think it is very difficult to plan curriculum because I have to coordinate a lot of different things. Uh, the cooperation, many teachers. I think it is necessary for students learning, but I think it's necessary for students learning, but I think will make us better citizen. Next slide, please. In Japanese school, there are classes where students learn about many things beyond the ordinary of their subject. At my school, we use these classes at the center of learning about the SDGs. In first year, students investigate what problems are occurring in the world by studying one of the 70 schools that interest them. The second year, students look at the cause, the international community's response, the impact and other aspects about the global problems. In the third year, the students explore what may, what they can do in their local communities to help solve global problems. For example, students who have taken up the issue of marine pollution uh, have spent the first year discussing the 40 schools of the SDGs, what, pro what the problems uh, what me measures the international committee is taking? What are new problems are emerging next year? For example, students will recognize the increase in plastic waste and the lifestyle that contrib contribute to it and think what, think what they can do to help. The last year, for example, they will recognize the increase in plastic waste and the lifestyle that lead to it and think about what they can do to help. Then we, uh, they will create posters to raise awareness of the issue among, the, among the, uh, their friends and school and regional society. These learning activities require students to learn on their own initiative. They decide on an issue and research it to deepen their understanding of the concept of SDGs. Teachers play a supporting role. Teachers need to be knowledgeable about the various SDGs. Since the school I work, at it's a public high school, so every student are able to learn, which make it easier to realize the philosophy of learning, leaving no one behind, no one left behind. Next slide, please. In my school, we started working on the SDGs three years ago. My school has our futures. Originally, the school is lo located in an industrial area, but the school has a field where students grow and harvest vegetables. The school also has a club activity to collect honey. School features to conduct environmental education. In addition, there are many students who come to the school right after coming to Japan from abroad. And we, we can often hear students talking, taking, talking in language, other language, uh, Japanese, uh, such as Chinese, Tagalog, and so on. Therefore, also some teachers have interest in uh, teaching skill and the environment and international, not of all, they knew about ESD or SDGs. Therefore, we held frequent training sessions to increase awareness of teachers. At first, half of teachers 
have never heard of SDGs or ESG, but now there are very few. However, the number of teachers who know the detail is still small. So we are trying to create opportunities for them to learn more about the SDGs. Also, there is a change of teachers. New teachers are given detailed explanations. It is important for all teachers and school staff to be involved, not necessarily a specific teacher. The core of the group is made of teachers from various subjects who are interested in ESD and would like to promote ESD and SDGs further. This group of teachers plan implement training session and participate in training session held outside the school. The students have generally given us good feedback. The students seem to be aware of the issues that they need to think about. We take a survey once or twice a uh, year using Google Home and make changes to the program as needed. However, we have yet to have a student graduate from this school, this program. I think we need to do better job for checking whether the students have learned what they have learned through various st studies after their they graduate, and it is important that we continue our effort to provide better education. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Asuka. You also provided a lot of concrete stories. So now, Nuda, listening to both Jinan and Asuka, I think there were a lot of suggestions and implications for teaching competencies, teachers' competencies required. So Asuka shared a lot of examples of how teachers collaborate with other teachers. Teachers need to collaborate with communities as well and listening to students. And Jinan also talked similar cases as well. The empathy is very important, value-based um, teaching. In order to do all of these, what are the teacher qualities and competencies needed to make those miracles happen at Asuka's and Jinan's school. And the second question also, when you identify the core teaching competencies, then you as a teacher trainer, what can you do to make it happen? Because Asuka said it took her three years to come here. So it wouldn't happen like this. Teachers need support. Teacher well-being is important. School leaders' well-being is important, Jinan too, right? So let's hear the teacher educators' our perspectives. Nuda, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Once again, it's a pleasure to be here and, and listen to what you have to say. I was listening carefully to Jinan and Asuka for teacher training in sustainable development, there are different skills that are needed. And I'm going to be talking about empathy. That's important. We need empathy. It's important also that individuals are committed to teaching about sustainable development, have a feeling of responsibility. We need teachers also to be people who have good social skills, who are happy to do general activities. Also people who are open-minded, who are happy to give constructive criticism and talk about the values. When I say someone who's who has good social skills, then that also means someone who likes sharing and is easy to work with. 
education for sustainable development isn't just something that happens in schools. It's something that involves the whole community and the whole of society. Everybody needs to be involved. And a teacher can be someone who supports other people, who supports them and what they do and is committed. Teachers need to be aware of local challenges that the community is facing, but also global challenges. Somebody who doesn't care about those kind of challenges won't be able to teach sustainable development. They won't have the right skills. Now, moving on to skills, someone teaching about sustainable development needs to have a good understanding of the concept and understanding the links between the production system, social systems and environmental systems. When I talk about environmental systems, I'm talking about the environment in general because sometimes in trying to combat poverty, then we are increasing production systems and using natural resources to increase well-being. It's not just about our well-being, though. We need to think about whether our management of resources is sustainable. Sustainability concerns the current generation, but also the generations to come. When using these material resources, we need to understand that the community and society in general need to protect the environment so that future generations will also be able to use it for their livelihoods. Those are the kind of skills that a teacher needs but there are also organizational skills that this person would need. A teacher who's committed to educating students about sustainable development needs to be open and able to take the initiative and then to be able to implement activities of general interest so that the measures can be properly implemented. To do that, a teacher needs interpersonal skills. They need to involve society, the community. They need to get everybody on board. That means keeping up good relations with one's neighbours in the community, in the school, but also in the community at large. A teacher needs to be able to communicate with everybody and create interest in these general interest activities. If someone isn't able to work with other people and motivate them, then this person won't be able to teach sustainable development as UNESCO and the international community would wish. Social relations are very important then. What we're trying to do is to include these qualities and skills in our programs for young teachers young teachers who are trained can then pass on these skills to their students. It's work that we do in a group. It's a team. It's teamwork. Sometimes this involves doing specific case studies and going to visit specific places. When a group 
visits a does an on-site visit then they will first of all observe and record the problems and once the problems have been categorized people will work together in a group to draw up a project a project designed to solve the problems that have been identified the project will then be assessed in-house and teachers can decide which are the most suitable projects. They may choose two or three and they will see how those projects could actually be implemented. That involves networking, forming relations, doing research and getting in contact with the authorities to have the necessary permits to carry out the projects. This is something that we teach our teachers to do so that they can educate in sustainable development. We also ask our trainees to draw up fact sheets. This means doing research and contacting useful people. Then, after that, they'll have an address book and know how to contact these people in the future. This is a way of getting the trainees to understand how to do their work. We also have UNESCO clubs, and that is where we really try to implement our uh, sustainable development objectives. That's what we're committed to. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Noda. Merci beaucoup. And uh, merci and uh, thank you very much also for participants uh, who actually wrote down some comments. And uh, please do use the chat uh, box for your questions later. And I can see that um, one of the participants, uh, Olvo Ostosom, uh, thinks that ESD always need to be taught interdisciplinary, just as Gina and Asuka said, all teachers need to address it. And Nuda had some approach to support that by networking, case studies, and also really specify the types of 21st century skills for teachers like empathy. It's very interesting. Empathy comes up for students and teachers as well. So there are some of the overlapping or repeated aspects as success factors. And now I would like to invite Sofiane, who is coordinating the school network. So just as we are doing right now for this session, he is doing it every day, looking at many schools and identifying success factors that are common across schools. So, Sofiane, can, I, can we invite you to introduce yourself and also start to share with us some success model and what are the success factors to make a success model work? Sofiane, the floor is yours. Merci, merci beaucoup, Miho, pour, pour cette introduction. Thank Donc, you je... very much. And thank you, Miho, for that introduction. I'm Sofiane Medour, and I'm the national coordinator of UNESCO Associated Schools in France. Now, before I start talking to you about our successful model that we have in France for these, let me say a few words about the network we have with the French Ministry of Education. We work very closely with them in the UNESCO context to attain the 2030 goals, seeking to have an overall global approach if possible. So could we move on now to the next slide? France, and as has been said, I coordinate the network in France, 170 schools in France and five thematic reference and trainers and they are in various different capacities. And that actually exists right across France per se, and also in the departments and territories that are not directly within France, but are overseas. And we focus on areas 
where it might be a little tricky to attain these sustainable development goals, and we try to make headway on that front. Now, we're moving towards a greater focus on climate change, and a number of schools in a number of, are involved in this. So we've got 10 initial schools that were involved in this project, and then further schools joined that subsequently to implement the overall approach to sustainable development within schools. That was the initial pilot project 2015, and this approach is one that echoes with what we call the E3D in France, the establishment that adopts a sustainable development approach. And the idea is that the entire school will address this in all aspects. So we've seen the JCED being addressed in this context, global citizenship education. The idea is that young people should become real multipliers on this front. We want these young people, these school pupils, to act as multipliers to get the message across to their family and all the other social contexts in which they're active. Now, in order to grasp the way in which this works in our overall institutional setup, I'd like to give you a specific example. Epernon is where the school is. It's got 500 pupils in it, and it's been part of the UNESCO Associate Network for quite some time now. It's in what we call a semi-rural setup, so not entirely in the deep countryside, but not in the city either. And they started to develop an overall system, first of all, because it's important to think about this upstream, and that's then addressed in the management body, the management board. But the idea is to resolve a difficulty. So first of all, we observe what the situation is. You need to identify what is needed, first of all. And we noted that there wasn't much green areas around the school. People felt they could just dump rubbish there. And in this school, there wasn't somewhere where young people in the school could meet and discuss these issues. Now, that was a need for the school, but we should bear in mind as well how it's possible to integrate other partners, such as local companies or indeed the municipality. The idea is that this should be an inclusive and transformational system. Now, once that's been determined, you need to come up with the goals. And the idea was to set up a community garden to grow vegetables, plus a playground area where young people could meet. And there was also the idea of planting other green areas. So we needed to take various steps on that front. We needed to set up a proper playground setup. We had some um, steps or seats seating there, seating come steps there in the playground area so the kids could sit there. And we also set up the vegetable garden and planted some plants. And what happened was that the young people, because they'd been involved, were much more respectful of their environment. They didn't litter nearly so much. And the city was, was also able to use this for events organized by the municipality. School governance is also an important topic as well as part of this overall assessment. And as I said, we want this to be transformational and to really foster sustainable development. We wanted to move away from a very rigid hierarchical structure where decisions would only be taken at the top and in this school that I'm talking about, everyone works together right the way through the school, including our so-called eco-delegates. And that means that all the topics are discussed before they're implemented. The schools are encouraged to take part in their school's government and to participate. And it's very important they're involved because they're contributing to the setting in which they move ahead and live their lives day in and day out. The idea is to allow everyone to have their say and to follow through in implementation. As I was saying earlier, the French network of UNESCO associated schools is fortunate enough to have five trainers, which we call who we call thematic experts, and they are involved in workshops to train 
the teachers of the UNESCO Associated Schools Network, and that also helps to learn about best practice in schools and to find out about projects which have worked out well, so we can duplicate that throughout France. I'd like to wind up on one final point now, which I think needs to be addressed. If you think about a global institutional approach, there's also the question of corporate social responsibility in this context. Michel Chasse is the school example we're talking about, and that's one very positive example as to how this can spill over into corporate social responsibility of business as well. School pupils put forward proposals on gender equality and sustainable development to a business, and those were then implemented. Thank you very much for listening. Merci, Sofiane. C'était excellent. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, from your presentation, what resonates with OECD analysis is ecosystem approach. It's not just one teacher, one school, but the whole community, yes. like you say, not the rigid. But many many regions are still struggling because they are they are never educated that way. So changing the mindset of those people, in fairness for them, it's not so much they don't want to do it, sometimes they don't even know. Some people are resistant, then all of us need to take different approach. So now, Angelica, who is facing the both of the challenges, changing or supporting changes who want to change or who don't want to change or who are not aware of that they need to change. So as a policymaker, Angelica, what do you do to make this ecosystem change happen at the system level? Can we invite you to share your experience, please? Thank you, Miho. I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Angelica Gomez Pizarro. I am the head of education for sustainability at the Ministry of Education of the government of the city of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Let me say it's an honor to be able to represent Latin America in this session and to share it with such high reference on education for sustainability. I'll do my best to speak in English. <laughs> so beforehand, I must say that the creation of the program Escuelas Verdes, the Green Schools Program, under the scope of the Ministry of Education was the result of the commitment assumed by the city government regarding sustainability and sustainable development. The Ministry of Education has the aim of designing, implementing and assessing public policies that empower people so they become active members in the process of the sustainable development of the city. Buenos Aires, next, please. Uh, Buenos Aires has 3 million of inhabitants, which represents a big challenge uh, for achieving a more human, sustainable development and created a, creating a more inclusive and resilient city. As UNESCO said, we have a unique opportunity to design and implement more inclusive and accessible societies. So it was the political will along with the full conviction that ESD is a must element to provide quality education and to train citizens committed to the reality and the challenges of the 21st century. The Buenos Aires Green Schools Program was born in 2010. It promotes sustainable development in education and environmental management in private and public schools. And today it reaches almost 6,000 students and more than 2,000 schools in the formal education system. Although the program works with all the actors of the education community, no doubt uh, there's a particular emphasis on students and how they are involved within the teaching learning process. Uh, it considers that students are potential agents of change capable of bringing the knowledge about environmental care and helping with the cultural change in their homes. 
In this context, um, all the actions and proposals of the program are promoted under that premise that students are leading actors, major players, and the multiplier agents of cultural change, capable of assuming a transformative and active role when facing the challenges of today's world. Next, to accompany them in this process, Escuelas Verdes, aims to provide an education with a critical, but at the same time transforming view of reality, which invites students to think about actual lifestyles and the current development model, also encouraging them to assume an active role in facing the reality in which they are part. To achieve this, we work with teachers promoting improvement strategies in teaching processes and meaningful learning experiences. Authentic, as you said, Miho, where students can get involved with the socio-environmental reality that surrounds them, learn about their rights and duties as builders of a just society and develop authentic autonomy for decision-making. Accordingly, in order, to, in order for them to unfold their potential as social actors, we promote project-based learning, addressing environmental problems both within the schools and in relation to the local community, and service learning through which students can put into practice their commitment to a reality that surrounds them, being aware of their rights and being responsible for their actions. We understand that learning environments extend beyond the walls of the schools when students have the possibility to put the knowledge, values and skills acquired in the classroom through the implementation of projects with community intervention and in, it, in articulation with civil society actors. Um, next, please. Uh, in this regard, I would love to bring you in one minute just the experience of an, a specific project that was carried out by students and teachers from a high school. In 2015, the students started a project called The Raft That Saves, La Balsa Que Salva. It was work with different teachers from different subject areas, such as social science, biology, technology, library and science lab. Specifically, the students together with their teachers conducted a study on phytoremediation through raft with biodegradable materials. First, they carried out research on phytoremediation technique using wastewater treatment. It is important to highlight here that this project was born from the interest of the students in the contamination of the river Matanza Riachuelo, one of the environmental programs that most affects the southern area of the city of Buenos Aires, where the school is located. This water course, which crosses several towns in the province and neighborhoods of the city, received for decades the waste from uh, factories that deepened the environmental crisis in the area. The students who create this project were also invited by the Environmental Protection Agency to participate in the making of beer rolls in which some of the plants of the students' project were cultivated and incorporated. In addition, last year, the students were invited by the neighborhood community to participate in a dialogue to address environmental issues of local interest. This school also organized the first student forum whose main purpose is to promote and exchange experience and good practices in environmental education. So um, as we can, we can learn about this experience and much more others to expand learning environments beyond the school's walls, uh, networking and articulation between members of the school community and neighbors is one of the main tools to achieve local impact and also bring possible solutions to problems. So thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Angie. You presented a very concrete case and what students can do when they are respected as agent of change themselves. And if I can ask you on behalf of the participants, since the participants gave us a lot of comments, positive comments, just confirming what you're talking, but not so much questions, then I have a lot of questions representing OECD countries because they are 
of course, moving towards the same direction as all of you are. You are pioneers in this field. But in reality, some countries and schools and teachers are facing a challenge of recognizing students as change agent themselves. Sometimes very protective and some teachers are afraid of giving more space. And our analysis suggests we cannot underestimate the fear of unknown among teachers because in order to support students, we need to support um, teachers who are afraid of unknown. So in your own capacity as a school leader or as a teacher or as a teacher trainer or a national network coordinator or a policymaker in your own capacity, what can you do to support teachers who are afraid of unknown? This is a big challenge OECD countries are facing. So if you can share your insight in your own role, let's take us ecosystem approach ourselves, presenting different perspectives to a common core challenge. So let me first ask a school leader who needs to lead such teachers, what can you do? Or what advice do you have for schools who have these teachers? Thank you so much for this amazing question. In fact, teachers, they need to feel secure as well. So as a leader, I need to coach them and give them a safe environment for just saying, I don't know. So it's okay to not to know, but it's very important to know how to learn and get trained and uh, work as a self learner as well, not only for a, as a, a, a trainee from the school leader. So yes, it's very important to uh, support teachers and tell them it's okay and reinforce the mindset of believing in our students as change agents as, uh, and as leaders. Excellent. And Gina, one question from the audience. How do you measure and monitor the success of ESD in a school? Definitely, this is as well a very important question because it's a just a school is like a small nation. You know, as the governance, we set our policies and we enter the policy into the curriculum and the practices of the teachers. And our aim is the decision making of the students and their behavior. So when we observe the behavior of the student and their outcomes as projects and mindsets into the assessments, we can tell if we are implementing correctly sustainability. Otherwise, we need to rethink our implementation at different levels in curriculum, strategies, maybe community service, etc., in order to implement it more. Excellent. Thank you, Gina. You are a living example of reflective leader. Perfect. Then Asuka, as a teacher, if you have peer colleagues who are afraid of the unknown world, what would you do? Mm, I always available to ask if I don't uh, uh, understand something. Um, I also study with them, in introducing them to book and website that can help them. Excellent. So Asuka is also trying to make them feel secured, that they have someone to turn on and rely on, just as Jinan, as a leader, is trying to do. Excellent. Then teacher, as a teacher educator, Nuda, what can, could you do to support the teachers who are resistant or who are afraid of the unknown world? Microphone for the speaker, please. Nuda, il faut que unmute vous-même. You need to switch your microphone on, please. Thank you. Yes, as I was saying, you need to make the teachers feel at ease. They're, of course, in charge of training those who will be in charge in future. So teachers 
need to be well informed about what's at stake. They need to have a sense of the order of magnitude of these issues and of the importance of sustainable development and education for sustainable development. They need to be made aware of those responsibilities. They're training the citizens of tomorrow. They're training them to take up tomorrow's challenges. You need to tell teachers that it's up to them to train those young people. It's a very important task to train these people who will be our future leaders. It's helpful as well to train them to do group activities as well, for example, on these topics. And that's very important no matter where teachers are working in these roles. And if they're dealing with very young children, they need to be assisted in putting into practice what they've learned in teaching college as well. We try to engage in vocational training for teachers, as I've said. We try to motivate teachers and show them, as I mentioned, how very responsible they are and how much responsibility they bear in training the citizens of the future. So we talk a lot amongst ourselves with teachers. There's a lot of dialogue and debate. We launch a range of projects and we organize research projects that involve everybody. And once they're used to these kind of teaching methods, they'll put it into practice in their schools. Let's hope. Thank you. Excellent. Merci beaucoup. And I can much. see that it's again informing teachers of the risks to make them feel reassured. But also, you started to hint at the importance of teacher agency. So teachers themselves are change agent themselves for the future. That's an excellent point too. And Sofiana, encore vous. So could you share your thoughts about if you have teachers like that in your school network, how could you address that? Thank you, Mio. I was saying that it was an excellent question. Teacher training is perhaps the key to all of this. We have our own teacher training network as part of our UNESCO network, and they really are key to make sure that our teachers who are on the ground have the right skills and can then achieve these sustainable development goals. So I would say they're a key part of, of our success. Thank you. Excellent. Once again, we need to learn from your approaches on this. So now, the um, Angie, again, the question for you, two questions. One is about these teachers who are a uh, fear of the failure and the, the, the unknown, but also a question from the audience as well. How do you monitor and measure the impact at the system level, at the policy level, the impact of ESD? So two questions for you. Thank you. Uh, in order, uh, in order to, towards the transformation of learning environments, the first challenge that we had to overcome was to consolidate ESD within the schools, within the institutional culture of the school. So it is hardly possible to transform learning environments and for the teaching learning process to transcend the boundaries of the school if there is not full conviction and commitments of the actors on the of the education community. And above all from the management and teaching teams. So uh, my first advice to the teachers is to, to encourage them to, to start uh, working with ESD at schools uh, 
and in their homes. And it, because uh, transformation always begins with the transformation of oneself, right? So we had to start transforming ourselves to be multipliers. So I encourage them because it's a wonderful uh, journey. <laughs> and um, and for the question of the audience about the impact of the policy, uh, we are uh, starting uh, an evaluation. I think it's uh, it's one of the the, the challenges that has uh, ESD to uh, see the, see results and see how it's done. So we are just walking that path to to make an evaluation of the program uh, within the the ten ten years from it it was created. So uh, I can let you know uh, furthermore. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. There's another question from the audience. Uh, and I also have a question thanks to uh, Angie, Angie as well. So two questions for everybody. Short answer. One question from the floor is, how much do you see that ESD is a cultural and political issue for schools and teachers? That's one question. Second question, following what Angie said, this is for everybody, including ourselves, to change, right? So including yourselves and myself too, there must be a moment when we said, aha, ecosystem approach, aha, ESD is authentic. So when did it happen to you? So maybe you as a pioneer, is more like a pioneer, maybe your own experience, changing your own mindset might be a good hint and implications for those people who want to be a pioneer in their own sphere too. So back to Gina. Yes, thank you so much. In fact, there are complementary questions, you know, because uh, the, the question that is said by the audience, is it a cultural or political issue? In fact, ESD, it involves everything, all issues re regarding the students. So, for example, here in Lebanon, when we had protests, we asked our students to come and express their thoughts in school and to do the protest in school as as celebrating their rights. So yes, it is a place to express and to reform all the practices that occur in their lives. And with respect to your question, which is very, very important, it is when we ask ourselves why we are teaching, what do we want from our students? If we want him an active citizen, then he needs to have all what he needs from skills, attitudes, knowledge, everything to do the sustainable development in his country and in the world. So that's when we start thinking about it. Thank you. Excellent. It's a good reminder. So those two questions are actually interrelated closely. Excellent. Then Asuka, as a teacher, what made you change yourself? Mm. What? My serve uh, uh, changed so addressing um, meet meet many people and have many different uh, opinions and I then there are many people and have many different uh, opinions so I have one, <laughs> one my thing, but no, not not many. I want many thinking. So uh, and understand the world and many religion and many sub uh, many problems and so. On. Thank Excellent. You. Your answer applies to students too. They need to be exposed to many role models and many issues and many meeting with many people. Very good. Okay, Nuda, mm. how about you? Et pour vous, qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est ça, ça, ça va changer. Ça, so ça a changé. Vous -même. What's changed in your view?
C'est la question pour vous, Nuda. Oui. It's a question for you, Nicola. Can you hear us? Uh, moi, je suis uh, de environnementaliste de formation. Je suis uh, naturaliste, donc. Euh, C'est pourquoi j'ai toujours euh, opté pour euh, euh, l'éducation environnementale. Et... The interpreters apologize. The sound is very poor with a lot of background noise. We shall do our best. Well, I started out in traditional teaching, but I've moved to education for sustainable development so that the children, the young pupils that we're dealing with become aware of these issues as well and share our concerns. That's why we're working on educational for sustainable development. But education for sustainable development is something that's holistic. It encompasses a whole host of different disciplines. And that means the politicians need to be involved, but of course, also teachers. Now we're aware of that in my country. In Senegal, educational, education for sustainable development has been incorporated into primary school education and there's actually in our basic teaching program, we've got two different areas. One of the most important of those is the idea of how we can all live together. That means being coming involved in associations, focusing on participation in various different social movements as well, to boost empathy, to boost solidarity as well, to foster a sense of citizenship, doing something for the public good. And then there's the question of living within one's environment. And that encompasses addressing solutions that are related to the environment. There's the issue of pollution, for example. There's the question of climate change and so on and so forth. And also, of course, when we look at these issues, we have to think about health. We have to think about poverty as well. They all intermesh these issues. So these are two important aspects of educational for sustainable development. And the world of politics in Senegal has taken these to heart, has included it into our elementary school training, into our primary school teaching, in fact, as a matter of fact. And there's also classes on the environment as part of our secondary school training. That's very important so that peoples become aware of the need to safeguard natural resources. Okay, Nuda, merci. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Nuda. So, as I was saying, to safeguard the environment and protect it and to act as a steward of that environment. So, that was what I had to say. And that's why I was saying that it's a holistic approach where both politics, the world of culture, teachers all have to work hand in hand to attain these goals. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So let's ask uh, Sofiane and Angelica so how they have changed to think like that, like you said, holistic and what really pushed their buttons. So Sofiane, we please unmute yourself again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Yes. Well, I think to answer this question, it's actually the political side of ESD that's important because young people really need to know what this is leading to. They're going to be building the society which is developing. They're developing as well as people. We then need to give them these key skills so that they can have a much more responsible society in terms of the environment in the future. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. You learned to connect dot, and that's very uh, not easy to do. But with your approaches, I'm sure we are making things happen. So, Angelica, how about you? We are approaching to the end, but uh, we want to hear from you. Okay, so thank you. About my moment of truth. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I grew up in, a, in the city of Buenos Aires, huge, huge city. Uh, but my father came from the country field. So, um, I have a dichotomy when I was growing up to seeing how he, uh, uh, how was his uh, life back in the rural zone and, and my life in the, in the urban zone. So, um, I think the moment of truth was just when I started um, working in education. Um, and the more I learn and the more I get in touch with with this, the more committed uh, I became, and uh, because I I could picture and realize the responsibility we had, because I think I I, I thought that but what what kind of person do I want to be in in this world and uh, what world what what kind of world do I want and and that was for me like well I have to build it. I have to be a part of it. Uh, it it doesn't came in in a box <laughs> because I'm here and I can do something. So I just get more involved, and I'm I'm still learning a lot. You have to learn every day, and so um, I encourage everyone just to keep learning, keep uh, having the empathy that uh, uh, Nuda was talking about, the teamwork, um, open-minded also just to, to, to be able to embrace all of this. And, and this is very transformative. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, more words in English, but <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Angie. So as a moderator, I didn't do a good job because I already have one minute over. But two things. One is please ask yourselves, audience, after reflecting what panelists said, the first question. We were planning to do the second poll, but we don't have time. But we want audience to think about the first question and re-ask re yourself whether you have changed your mind after hearing the panelists or not. And the second, what I got out of you, the panelist, is ESD is of course holistic, political, social, demographic, and environmental and economic, all of this. But what is important for students is it has to be personal too. Because I often hear from teachers and students, oh, ESD is somebody very intelligent people are doing and they alienate themselves. But it has to be personal too. And you shared your personal stories that will stick in my mind. So let us not lose sight of big challenges, but it has to be rooted in agency, individual agency. So thank you very much. And thank you audience for all your positive comments and questions. I hope to see you somewhere virtually or face to face somewhere in the world. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kohei and Claudia for and June, who couldn't be with us, but for the excellent organizations. Bravo to the um, German team and UNESCO team. Thank you very much. Bravo. Thank you to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I start now?
Yes. Okay, welcome to the session on building capacities of the educators. We will look at knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes required for educators to guide and empower learners towards the transition to sustainability. We use the term educators in this context because this includes not only school teachers, but also community-based educators and facilitators. The role of educators is the key in developing learners sustainability attitudes and behavior. While the world needs to initiate the new approaches in economic, health, and education systems in order to make sustainability the default position in addressing developing challenges. To be able to guide and facilitate the empowerment of learners, educators themselves need to be empowered and equipped with the knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes that are required for this transition towards sustainability. This session focuses on the capacity of educators, which is one of the five priority action areas of ESD for 2030. This session's objectives are as follows. Number one, what competencies are required for educators to be able to guide and empower learners towards a transition to sustainability? Number two, how much competencies can be enhanced? And number three, what are the key factors enabling teachers to fully develop, um, deliver their mission of facilitating development of learners? Learners' capacities to become um, change agents for sustainability. I did not introduce myself. My name is Yumiko Yokozeki. I'm a director of UNESCO Institute for International Capacity, UNESCO International Institute for Capacity Development in Africa, ICBA and I'll be your facilitator for this session. We have uh, our five panelists, uh, Mr. Marcello um, uh, Slerizo Orozco, and uh, Mr. Leifa Osman um, from uh, universities, and uh, Ms. Gracia Mando Mando uh, Mandolini, a teacher from Argentina, Mr. Jean Belle, an expert from um, um, Cote d'Ivoire, and Dr. Jihan Kamal from uh, Egypt. We would like this session to be interactive, so please do not hesitate to write your question on the chat. Uh, please don't use Q&A, we would like to use the chat. And if you see the questions which are interesting to you, please don't hesitate to respond. So I'm going to um, invite the first speaker, Mr. Marcello and Suazelo Orozco, I'm sorry, I should have uh, uh, practiced, uh, Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, United States. Um, would you please share with us your vision on transformative education for sustainability and the role of educators in 21st century? You have uh, seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Good day from Boston Harbor. Writing on the ruins of a defeated Italy at the end of World War II, an educator, Loris Malaguzzi, father of the Reggio Emilia schools, came to see education as a project of nostalgia. Not a nostalgia for the ruinous past that fascism bequeathed, but a nostalgia for the future. This great educator wrote, quote, we should think that we have more need of being nostalgic, not so much about the past, but nostalgic about the future. The children expect us in the future where our nostalgia now sees them. And end of quote, a nostalgia for the future sees the world work of education as cultivating the signs of healthy, flourishing, and engaged children. In the Platonic tradition, education endeavors to nurture that which is true, logic and science, that which is good, ethics and justice, and that which is beautiful, aesthetics. Creating a more inclusive, humane, just, and sustainable world is the urgent challenge of educators the world over. 
in the admirable and truly revolutionary words, setting forth the goals for SDG 4.7, our educators must ensure that, quote, all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including, among others, through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of culture's contribution to sustainable development. Basic education today, thanks to the extraordinary work of our educators worldwide, is a normative ideal throughout the world. The empirical data suggests that great progress has been made by teachers, by educators, giving boys and girls access to schooling. Prior to the pandemic, the enrollment of young people in primary education was almost universal, and it is clear that the gender gap was being narrowed. The work of educating children and youth is culturally constituted, highly varied across societies and ever evolving. Schools, while seeking in the work of teachers, nomothetic approaches should reflect and reflect upon the environmental, cultural, and socioeconomic realities of the communities in which they form an essential part. The curiosity and joy of learning at a young age is the key all educators have to open the door to the gold standard of any education system, molding lifelong learners who have the tools and the joie d'apprendre to continue learning long after formal schooling stops. I give you Sir Isaac Newton's eternal words of curiosity and joy in learning. Quote, Newton says, I seem to have been only a little boy playing on the seashore, diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble, a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. There is the Newtonian theory of curiosity as the key for educators to open, to open the great ocean of truth for all youth. The global COVID-19 pandemic laid before the world to see the deepening inequalities in opportunities to learn worldwide. In the largest school districts in countries around the world, students from the most underserved communities have become our desaparecidos. As their peers migrated to remote learning, thousands of students are nowhere to be seen. A full year after the onset of the pandemic, by the first quarter of 2021, more than 160 million children around the world, quote, have missed school for nearly a year due to COVID-19 restriction, restrictions. David Bloom, my colleague, currently at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, writes of COVID's impact on education, quote, school closures and difficulties in implementing effective remote learning generally reduce the pleasure of learning, hinder children's socialization opportunities, degrade the emotional and mental health of students, and increase the risk of domestic violence, end of quote. The second huge problem we're facing is the problem of racialized inequality as education's implacable foe. In the words of the our eminent Argentine cognitive neuroscientist, Sebastián Lipina, quote, different poverty indicators are associated with lower cognitive performances during several stages of development. Neural evidence generated in the last decade suggests that the need to review the interpretations of the associations in the sense of deficit and consider the occurrence as an adaptive process instead. 21st century economies and societies are predicated on two paradigms, increase, increasing complexity and increasing diversity. 
the twin corollaries on, of an ever more globally interconnected, miniaturized and fragile world. Educators today must mind the gap between what education is and what education needs to be. On the ways each family is unhappy when it comes to education. If all families are happy the same way as in Tolstoy's unforgettable first line in Anna Karenina, here are three of the most important ways educators today are struggling with unhappiness qua education. First, quality education from early childhood onwards remains an elusive mirage for millions of our students. Children learn to read and thereafter, as Jean Chol at Harvard once said, spend their lives reading to learn. Reading is epigenetic. Cognitive neuroscience has beautiful, is beautifully mapping how it literally changes the structures of the brain. But literacies today, every teacher knows, go far beyond the written text. As such, we need an architecture of literacies as millions of children and youth are now citizens of an app world. Continuing Professor Marigeno, would you like to wind up? But you have already uh, passed the time. I will finish now. Literacies today need to continue uh, to be developed deeper into so children can manage social media with the aid of uh, teachers, remote teaching and learning modalities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for a very passionate um, and excellent first intervention. I think you set the tone very, very nicely. Here I'm inviting June, June for the que uh, question. We are going to have a little interactive uh, activities. So please, June, can you put the uh, question? Yes, thank you very much. So we have prepared two questions which go now to the audience. Please be ready. Um, Mariana, can you put it on the screen? Yes, thank you very much. So, so the first question is, what is the most important capacity do you think that a teacher nowadays should have in putting ESD into practice? We have prepared six options and can you try to pick up one, the most important capacity that you think a teacher should have in putting ESD into practice? Thank you. Let's take a few, a couple of minutes here. Okay, so here is the results. It's quite interesting. Uh, we have, I think, today around, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 70 participants who are listening to us. And here is the result. So the most important item, knowledge about sustainability issues, then pedagogical techniques. I think then it's followed by creativity. Yeah, very important collaboration, leadership, and anticipation. Over to um, the moderator, Yumiko-san. Thank you very much. This is very interesting that the knowledge about sustainability in, was the highest. That shows probably our educators might not have uh, enough uh, knowledge and, uh, and so on. But it's also very good to have a um, creativity as a higher rating. Can we go to the uh, next? Uh, there are two questions. Can you share no, another question? No, the, the other question will come later. So please move on with thank the next you. speaker. Thank, thank, you thank, you. Very much. I, thank you very much. Now the next question goes to Professor Leif Ostman of Uppsala University. Based on your experience, what 
uh, competencies, which are uh, knowledge, skills, values, and attitude are the most critical for educators to be able to guide and empower learners towards sustainability and why. Please. Thank you very much for, uh, for asking this question and to invite me to share, share our work. Um, so what sort of competences do we need as teachers to be able to perform high quality sustainability teaching? To be honest, we need a lot. First of all, we need a lot of correct and up-to-date knowledge about what to teach. What in terms of knowledge about the many sustainability challenges facing our society today, as well as about potential solutions for these problems. We saw that, in the, that this was also right, rated very highly. On top of that, we also need insights and knowledge about how to teach about sustainability challenges in the best possible ways. This knowledge is continuously produced by education didactic research. So I think it's obvious for all of us that sustainable development teaching is a very challenging thing to do. Let me mention a couple of things that make it, makes it amazingly challenging. We need to teach about issues that are very complicated, such as climate change. And the question which solution are desirable seem to cause a lot of disagreement. This creates a lot of didactical challenges regarding how to teach. For example, how to give the students insight into to the complexity of sustainability issues without paralyzing them. How to deal with disagreement in the classroom without falling into polarization. How to unlock the unique pedagogical <laughs> potential <laughs> of engaging with real world problems in the classroom. How to let students experience a sense of agency, etc., etc. Knowing all this, it looks like we are facing a tragedy. And the tragedy is that it is not possible for every individual teacher to acquire all this knowledge. This becomes even more pressing when we realize through research the fact that most crucial factor for students' learning is the teacher. But don't despair. I will present a radical proposal to overcome this tragedy, which is in line with strategies of, for example, the Swedish International Development or Cooperation Agency, it is radical, but it is possible. In fact, it is something that we at this moment are concretely working on in an European Union funded project called SEAS, Science Education for Action and Engagement Towards Sustainability. In this project, we develop a digital infrastructure for each country that had participate in the project. The infrastructure contains five crucial elements and each of them are focused on creating collaborations and colleague learning. The first element is that teachers, NGOs, authorities, and com companies can upload lesson plans and teaching materials into a digital library. The second is that the uploaded lesson plans and materials can be downloaded by teachers and others for free. The library is a public domain open for everyone. It is a common. Thirdly, the library contains a good search in engine, making it possible for teachers to, for example, search lesson plans in relation to goals expressed in national curricula and syllabuses. What makes the proposal radical, new in comparison to already exist, is the fourth and the fifth elements. The fourth element is that teachers work together with researchers, staff of NGOs and companies in order to co-create lesson plans and other materials. This is a crucial ingredient to overcome the tragedy I mentioned. In the co-creation, teachers can add their unique competences, the researcher there, and so on. In this way, we can make it possible to bring together the diverse and complementary competences needed to create high quality sustainability teaching. The fifth element is that teachers, researchers, students, and so on, take part in process of quality care with the help of several digital tools. It makes it pos possible to continuously improve the quality of the material uploaded in the library. In that way, the library, library becomes not only better and better over time, but all the same, 
This arrangement provides hands-on capacity building and a continuous source of inspiration for teachers. Altogether, this makes it possible to resolve the tragedy that, that it is impossible for teachers to acquire all the knowledge needed. In the same time, we can solve the problem teachers reinventing the wheel over and over again, and thereby give teachers the possibility to care for our world and the students through high quality teaching. This digital infrastructure and its associated tool and collaborative practices allows, allows us to radically innovate how we think about and practice also capacity building for teachers. Let me illustrate with some examples. By using the uploaded lesson plans and materials in teacher education, students can practice in making didactic analysis for existing teaching practices and use these as a source of inspiration to develop their own portfolio. Through such a hands-on approach, the gap between theory and practice can be bridged. In service training, connected to using the digital library can make the capacity developer to become product-oriented product and not only theoretical or ID-oriented. At the end of the training, the participant can take home not only some new theoretical insights and ideas, but also a set of lesson plans and teaching materials that are directly useful in their own practice. Thus, developing all the required capacities for sustainable development teaching can become a collective instead of an individualized endeavor. It becomes a continuous process in which capacity building and quality care go hand in hand, driven by concrete challenges in teachers' day-to-day -day practice and organized in a way that is hands-on co-creative and output oriented. It can be an engine for much needed educational innovation through supporting and empowering the most decisive factor for students' learning and their well-being and health, that is, the teacher. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, um, Professor Ostermann. It was a very practical um, ideas um, which are um, already implemented, I suppose. Uh, there is one question uh, asking for uh, sharing of the, your library link. So would you be so kind to share it on the chat box, please? Yeah, I will, I will please make it possible for the person to come back to me in, in end of this term or in the beginning of August, because we are just doing our beta version of all this and the project has continued, it's continuous for one and a half year more, so we are we are creating this and filling it up with materials as we go on. But please okay. get in contact with, with me. And uh, we have all the beta versions, but it would be pity to send it out before it's really tested and really good. Okay, I understand. So we shall uh, wait, look forward to it. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ostermann. Now, the next question goes to uh, Ms. Graciela Mandolini. She's a teacher from an uh, 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 affiliated um, school of uh, education international from Argentina. So, um, teacher Graciela, I would like to ask the following <coughs> question. In your opinion, are the educators in your country well equipped with these competencies required for promoting sustainability? How can we support teachers to develop them? Do you have one good example to share? Please go ahead. Thank you. Buenos días. Eh, voy a hacer mi good afternoon. I will be speaking Spanish this afternoon. I just wanted to thank you, first of all. I wanted to thank UNESCO and the Berlin conference organizers for organizing this event and for inviting me to come along and speak and also to Education International. I'd like to thank them also for allowing me to come along and participate here today. Sustainable education is something which is in uh, ongoing development and the authorities in uh, Argentina have developed some practices along these lines and by looking at the curricular programs and the plans, uh, looking which are involving uh, environmental issues and sustainable development in our educational programs. But we can see that progress in, in, in Argentina. We have got a legislation on uh, the integral environmental legislation. Uh, There's a law which is actually 
um, established a public policy for the uh, country, which uh, which actually establishes uh, a need for um, ag environmental uh, matters to be um, covered across the board. So we talk about equality, uh, recognizing the biodiversity, the uh, need to protect uh, the our natural heritage and and and. Uh, the health of our environment. So this is an integral legislation across the country. But I think also what's important is that it has got a it has got a uh, it, it's being implemented intergenerationally and across the board. So in the gener in the educational body, it is actually being implemented and it informs all of our policies, educational policy, in, which affects all the children in the country. It is a public policy. It has got a, a strength and it actually and focuses on citizen in involvement in sustainability. So this legislation has given us some impulse. And I think also we've seen that the environmental urgency has also uh, given rise to a new urgency in our educational programs as well. We're living through historic moments. We're seeing a constant change. We're seeing new events arrive all the time, environmental, climate, climate uh, health issues, food in issues, economic issues, and all of these new events are uh, com coming together, leading us to uh, have to take take action. Over the last 25 years, where we've seen that we've had to work with great conviction on a project which is actually aimed at creating new uh, areas of knowledge to enable us to actually develop the, the, the competences and the ped pedagogy that we need by looking also at uh, the, all sectors of our economy and our society. And I think that in the future, we're, see, we're going to be able to see how successful this has been. This way of trying to actually consolidate this knowledge has enabled us to work together to try to develop environmental education education for sustainable development. This is one of the fundamental pillars of the activities, the, tra the pedagogical activities that has been developed by the, uh, the um, CETERA uh, body, which is the Confederation of Education Workers of, Argentine, of the Argentine Republic for, educational, uh, for environmental education and sustainable development. We have been working on this uh, front of sustainable development and education for some time. At, at national level, we have actually set up a um, a, a centre for uh, pr for educating uh, for. for preparing educators in this area. And we have been working through organizations, a grassroots basis from CETERA, from our, our, uh, our um, uh, confederation. And we have been looking at how we can uh, involve all types of, of grassroots bodies in this. And we've been teaching, um, We've been uh, teaching in all, in all areas through various um, proposals, but through various, and various organizations. So Cetera is actually developing information with a, a clear methodology to help all of our educators at different levels and wherever they are to have the, the, perm the tools at, the, at their disposal to actually ensure that they are able to uh, provide the information and the le lessons that are required. This has enabled us to ensure that we are working uh, together and that we have developed, we've developed a, a practice which is um, uh, covering the, all topics that, 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 that are, need to be covered. We in Argentina have been um, trying to uh, make uh, proposals depending on the um, the requirements of the of the uh, the particular situation that we are that we are face faced with. So we have face to face teacher training uh, programs. We have uh, got practical activities. We uh, are involved in uh, different. Uh, local activities, uh, practical activities uh, to uh, include programs and actions on environmental education across a number of different arenas. So we have uh, looked at uh, the 
various uh, inputs from the re regional and the local communities we have tried to cover also their own their 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 local uh, um, interests, uh, to seeing where the community can actually uh, can participate in this by expressing their stories, hearing their voices, learning of their histories, learning of their past, uh, so, and the the traditions in those in those in those uh, communities. So for us, this is very important that we are actually using this knowledge of the environmental and the the community and the environment in which we're working. This has got to be part and parcel of our education for sustainability and. It's it's got to enable us to develop new initiatives and it's, we're able in this way to interact work, working with and for uh, sustainability. This is the concept uh, which is put behind all of our actions. That's why we think it's very important to see how we actually make this content available, the way in which we present this information, the mechanics that are involved in, uh, in our work, how we can actually promote and participate uh, within the community. Now, if you can move on to the next uh, the next slide, uh, here Mandel, you'll see some of the activities that we have up. undertaken. Would you like to wind up? Sí, sí, justamente. ¿Cómo no? Yes, yes, I will conclude. So, just on this last slide, I wanted to show you some of the proposals that we were we, that we have for for uh, sustainable for for continual uh, training for educators. Uh, we've we, th these are the various areas in which we provo we propose permanent training on education uh, on environmental education, sustainable development. We have online. Um, online training sessions we have uh, we work on with video conferences interviews through social networks as you can see we work with this uh, the educational platforms and we try to ensure that education for sustainable development is at the center thank you thank thank you very much for sharing this very exciting and very uh, practical experience from argentina we are now going to move to um africa um, Monsieur Jean Belle is an expert for eco santé et development rubble of uh, Côte d'Ivoire. So, um, Mr. Jean Belle, can you hear me? What was the biggest Mais, challenge you faced? Je vous entends très bien. Merci, merci, merci madame. Merci. Je vais poser une un question je... en anglais. Hein? What was the biggest challenge you faced in addressing sustainability issues? with your learners and how did you manage to overcome thank you merci madame Je thank you very much First of all, I'd like to thank UNESCO for having invited me to participate in this conference because I think it shows that what we have been trying to do here in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, in Africa, so not actually, we have not been carried out in vain because it is part of the whole process of sustainable development and we are quite convinced that we have been working in the right direction, that we've been moving in the, on along the right path and that we have been providing our educators with the right tools. So what are the challenges that we we've tried to uh, to uh, w deal with, to what have we tried to overcome, what have challenges we have had to overcome to uh, progress our uh, ESD program. In the Africa, we're a little bit behind compared to other developed countries because of the way in which our national uh, education programs have been developed. Education here has been based mainly on knowledge, on acquiring knowledge. We develop the knowledge or we increase the knowledge of, of our, of our, of our uh, students. They can all uh, recite by heart the things that they've learned at school, but is that enough for them to be able to properly be part of, of, the, of our society? And that's why NGOs have actually worked with us and uh, encouraged us to actually um, get involved with education for sustainable development because development um, sustainable development has, is not just a question of the economy, it's, it's a question of social development and also preserving our environment at the same time. There are three pillars but enabling us to develop and, to, and to clearly define what sustainable development should be. 
So that has enabled us to actually read, uh, to, to approach our educators. And the greatest challenge that we had to overcome was on how we could train our educators. Our educators, our teachers, our uh, experienced teachers, but they have a certain level of, of knowledge. And so we wanted to try and develop a, a new savoir-faire, a new, a new level of knowledge within our educators and our teachers. So psychologically, we had to ensure that they were able to use their, their teaching plans, their tools to provide the information to the children, but enable them to actually use this information in a practical manner. We've also had to develop amongst uh, within the teachers a, a, a proper savoir-être, a way of, uh, so that the child would know how to, de uh, to develop an attitude which uh, would enable them to be more active in a particular field and, and, and recognize which, actives, which uh, areas they needed to adapt to their knowledge to. Along with the National Education uh, Agency, we developed our ministry, we developed a, a, a guidebook for teachers to try and uh, increase their capacity. And we have also had a, an awareness raising exercise with students and uh, pupils to make them aware as well of how they should uh, view the uh, elements of biodiversity that are being taught about with the issues concerning water, waste, uh, health and energy. So these were uh, uh, new elements which are part and parcel of their everyday life, In uh, but they were not really aware of how important those elements really were. And yet we're calling upon them to be part to be actors in the educational sustainable uh, education for sustainable de development and we've got to teach them not to waste water for example because water is scarce in certain families in certain states we've got to develop that knowledge and that awareness if we want to ensure that we're able to make sure that people have the basic requirements for uh, all of the populations so they've we've got to make sure that they are aware of this, that they understand the importance of preserving and making sure that we are, uh, that, that these resources can be sustainable for all populations. And that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to show young people in our society how to better use resources so that we can actually have longer sustainability or greater sustainability. So we selected the schools because in the Ivory Coast, not all schools have the same level or are developed at the same level as, as, as all others. There are some schools in our country that where there aren't actually, where there isn't any water, where there, there are... Um, where the circumstances are different. So there might be 500 young people in, in one of these schools where they, they don't have running water. So how can we teach them about the importance of cleanliness and health? Uh, we've got to actually help them to really understand um, the, the basic information and use that information correctly and for, for them too to benefit from the opportunity when they are older, when they're older, they'll be able to be an exam example um, to better develop schools. The other challenge, another challenge that we had in our country is that we are, we're a poor country. We need to find the resources if we want to finance the development of this project that, that we'd set up. An American company and an American uh, uh, companies did actually reach out to us and enabled us to set up a project for sustainable development. There are national studies and we have uh, also, for example, got uh, agricultural companies which have also helped us to uh, finance all of this. But the third challenge that we had to we were confronted with was that we didn't want to create a whole new programme. We actually are part of a national education programme and we have actually taken the notion of, of sustainability from the, the program and we have asked the teachers to use their capacity to actually develop the notion of sustainability in their daily habits and in the daily habits of our pupils at school. So those were the challenges that we had and once we'd overcome those, uh, those, those uh, challenges we were able to go out into the field and to develop a whole uh, the notion of sustainable development by, by also working on citizenship 
What's been a great shame is that the state itself. Sorry. Can you, can you uh, conclude, please? Yes, I will conclude. Well, as, as I was saying, the, the, the program that we had uh, that we have, we had set up and the, the, this plan was of interest to the state, but it's actually been shelved right now because we haven't got the finances to continue with this these lessons for all schools in Ivory Coast. We have only got 60, 56 can, the schools that have been able to be. Um, which have been able to participate in this, only some 600 uh, teachers involved in this project, but we haven't been able to continue or expand the project because we haven't had the funding. So that's why I'd like to thank you very much for including us in this conference, which is very important to us. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Landron Valley, for our uh, excellent uh, examples from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Now I'm asking uh, June, Morohashi to come and then uh, uh, share with us a question um, for all of us to respond to. So, Jim, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Yumiko. So today uh, we had a series of presentation. We have actually another one, right? After this very important question, which goes again to the audience, we heard about the vision of the 21st century uh, role of educators, uh, vision of uh, education uh, on sustainable development, what are the skills necessary, and very different examples of efforts to support teachers. But in your view, in your context. Now I'm very happy to share that we have 83 participants who are listening to us. So dear participants, in your opinion, what support do educators need in listening to uh, these presentations? Plus, I guess, on your uh, specific experiences. And this time, please leave your ideas in the chat box, discussion box, freely. Uh, but uh, if possible, uh, using only the keywords. So once again, what support do educators need? Please use the discussion box to leave your ideas. Let's take again a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now I have a first comment, resources and license to operate, integrated action problem-based courses to make them also compulsory as part of the teacher education. Yes, training again. Uh, educators need more teaching learning resources, flexible curriculum, yeah, very good point. Capacity building, yes, uh, to be creative in planning their lessons. So I guess uh, that requires also uh, quite much flexibility in doing so. Recognition, of course, yeah, very, very important. Materials, once again, content and methods. The same as the students' action competence. Yeah, so teachers should have the same action competence, uh, knowledge, motivation, opportunity, and then the skills to put into didactic action. Yes, this is really professional skill, pedagogical skill that we were discussing a bit earlier. Time, yes, this is uh, often raised as a big challenge for teachers to be fully uh, implement ESD. They don't have time. Their uh, agenda is very, very uh, tight already. An important measure of reaching the SDG 4.7 at large is involving the teacher unions and the union representatives at different levels. Yes, very important partners. Different things depending on the age of children. Yes, this is really a demanding actually a task to teachers who are dealing with different age group uh, students indeed. Capacity building, resources, flexibility, flexibility, resources, Ah, very important support from school directors. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there are many, many good ideas. Maybe I will have to stop around here. Community of practice, yeah, networking. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we have very, very many uh, reactions, which is great. Uh, we will make it sure that all your ideas be noted in uh, our final uh, report.
Thank you so, so much. Okay, so maybe I will have to um, send it back to you, Miko. Yes. Thank you. Was this was very exciting. It shows that uh, participants have uh, such good ideas. And, uh, and uh, yes, this is a wonderful session because, um, because of the knowledge and, and also attitude of the participants. So thank you very much. Please keep writing. So I will go to the last panelist speaker from Egypt, Dr. Jihan Kamal Mohammed El Said is from National Center for Educational Research and Development. So, ahlan wa sahlan, Dr. Jihan. My question to you is as follows. We often say that in order to make our current and future world a just, peaceful, and sustainable place, we need to transform ourselves and our societies. In your opinion, what the key enabling factors do teachers need to fully achieve their mission to develop learners' capacities to become change agents? Please, over to you. Shukran Gizilan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, uh, any change uh, for the teachers uh, so that they can become agents of change, so that should be very trained. Uh, trained very well so that they can transfer this knowledge for our world and for the future. This, of course, this will be done through training. Uh, before they enter into service, they will be trained and we have uh, a, an environment that will help them so that uh, we will develop their uh, abilities and that themselves will become an agents of change. Also, Teachers need extensive training and support in order to develop their abilities and so they will become agents of change. Also, this exchange of experiences between the different teachers about the best practices through their work and through the electronic platforms. They also need the teachers uh, themselves uh, uh, have the incentives uh, so that they can really work for this change and they can transmit this knowledge. Uh, developing their capacities, uh, of course, is extremely important, but it is limited uh, because of the, the ambitions. In some cases, uh, uh, teachers have the guide uh, and training will focus uh, on the content of that uh, without any follow-up uh, for what is happening. This, of course, uh, makes it quite clear that we need to develop uh, teachers' training uh, in a strengthened and sustainable manner. Also, we need uh, a program for multimedia so that we can help these teachers uh, to work uh, and to acknowledge and uh, uh, acquire some knowledge uh, and that will develop their cap capabilities. Uh, in Egypt, uh, for example, we have the, the Knowledge Bank. Uh, this is uh, an archive, maybe a bank for the internet which uh, provides uh, uh, the educational training course and all the tools the teachers require, like videos and also the researches. There is also a platform for this Egyptian bank, knowledge bank, and this, of course, provides the teachers with the data and the materials and all what they need. Also, we need to prepare a multimedia program, a strong one, so that we can develop uh, the abilities of these teachers so that they can become more involved in the knowledges and experiences uh, and these values. We also need uh, materials to support the teachers on top of having uh, these methods of further increasing their abilities so they can really go with this and provide this change uh, and 
therefore, we will be uh, an important element. Uh, we also need to use the internet uh, to provide them with this uh, in a constant way, uh, so that uh, we will have all the files that can, they can have, uh, and they will be provided uh, free of charge while using, using of course, the mobile phones uh, and all the other uh, means like videos, digital videos. So we also need uh, to have a wider base uh, of the society and large uh, so that they can support uh, the capabilities of the teachers uh, and uh, how they are working in this uh, uh, new uh, attitude. Of course, uh, teachers uh, should be able uh, to deal with the new changes in the 21st century. We also need to provide the culture or to, to manage uh, this uh, change, this vital change, by helping the teachers to use new methods uh, and how to work uh, themselves in order to make uh, this change possible. Of course, we have to work uh, with the perspective of sustainable development uh, while strength stressing the fact that uh, uh, lifelong uh, education is extremely, uh, learning is extremely important by using all the means available at our disposal. Also, we have to uh, strategic uh, plans uh, and programs uh, for uh, helping these teachers uh, do that in the, as university or before that, uh, so that they can cope with the new developments in the world uh, and they can have their capabilities improved. And finally, we have to strengthen uh, that uh, people should be given all the help they need so that they can be very effective in making this change possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jihan Kamal. That was beautifully said. And then it was perfect before the last speaker, last panelist. Now here, I'm going to open the floor for questions and the comments. On, on your uh, bottom line, there is a raise hand, uh, raise hand uh, symbol. Can you press it so that the, uh, I know who is... Uh, asking question, who would like to ask a question? No, Yumiko-san, there is no option to okay. open the floor. So the questions needs to be raised in the discussion box. Thank you so oh, much. Discussion box. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The chat box, uh, beg your pardon. Uh, so please write your uh, question on the uh, chat box. And uh, there was one question about um, Professor Osman's uh, library and uh, wanted to know how they could uh, access it when it is ready. Uh, Professor Osman, would you like to uh, briefly tell us how we can uh, access it and when it is it becomes available? Yeah, uh, it's important to say that we develop national uh, libraries, but also connecting to an international. And here we work very closely together with UNESCO and, and see of all the possible synergy effects that we can have from the regional the platforms they have and to get together with the national ones. Uh, and of course, anyone who's interested to create one, it's of course welcome to contact, contact us. But it's important to say that uh, this project has gone on together with teachers and researchers from six different countries. And we are co-creating teaching materials together with them. And we're also creating this digital library with its tools, but it's also co-created with teachers because you can't create anything that is sort of from, from, from uh, ivory tower and think that will be useful for teachers. So we are really very much testing at this moment. So please, we will, if you can have some patience with us, we, we really welcome you to come back maybe after summer so we can share some ideas. And of course, you can get in contact with us before that too, so we can share our ideas and how we do it and, and possibility not only to build it in the six, the six countries, but also for other ones that are interested. Uh, so please, you're really welcome to get in contact with us. Uh, and and uh, yeah, that's what I can say at the, at the moment. But we are, we are in a beta version, so we are testing now with the teachers. So that Thank is you important. very much. There is a related question. Will the materials be in language other than Swedish? 
Yeah, there will be at the moment will be in six different languages. Uh, so it will be national libraries because the national libraries is very important because you can connect it directly to the national demands and curriculums. But it will also be international where we can also upload people that want to translate the materials and upload it to share more internationally because as we as we seen by the all the the um, comments by by the panel by the participants time is so important for teachers and of course instead of me sitting in sweden and in, in, inventing a, a lesson that is already invented in in tanzania i could rather use that one as an inspiration source and that i will save incredible lot of time and also have better quality of course when we have this collegial and peer learning so quality and time doesn't have to be to to be op op opposition to each other it can be at the same time something that can work together but we have to start to share between uh, between countries in countries and between silos not only teacher with teachers but also researchers and teachers ngos and 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 so on and authorities we need to really break the silo thinking here and and try to together create all this knowledge and capacity that is needed to create really good teaching. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's a very interactive library. Uh, uh, there are call? some other questions, so I'm call? going to read them. Uh, okay. Yes? Yeah, no, sorry. There was a question in French, and I think uh, it was meant for Mr. Bailey. Uh, okay, please. Uh, uh, it says, uh, l'accompagnement des enseignants, c'est-il fait avec le concours du ministère de l'Éducation nationale? Is that done with the support of the National Education Ministry or some other means? Mr. Bele, over to you. Monsieur Bele. Yes, I was listening, but I don't think I heard the question. Okay, la question est la suivante. Okay, I'll repeat it. L'accompagnement des enseignants. The support for avec teachers, le concours du ministère de l'Éducation nationale through the National Education Ministry or is it organized in some other way? Continue parce que je n'ai pas entendu toute la question. I still didn't hear the end of the question unfortunately. Says oui. Mr. Belle. La question était la suivante, on okay, voudrait savoir si l'accompagnement des enseignants teachers support avec le concours du ministère de l'éducation nationale de la Côte d'Ivoire uh, provided by the Côte d'Ivoire National Ministry for Education. Well, what I can tell you is that uh, as we're not talking about a new program that interfere with the ministry's education program, we set up an agreement with the ministry uh, that's on the basis of a signed document. And uh, there's a, an organization called TV, DVS, uh, which is school support. And we've been working with them. So the ministry has been working with us. And in fact, they even encouraged us uh, to develop training programs that could be used for the whole country. And they sent us into teacher training colleges so that we could help them incorporate this into the syllabus. So yes, we have had the support of the ministry. They're still working with us and they're still very keen on what we're doing. But as you know, our resources are limited. And we often have to turn to the ministry to help us with the teacher training. Okay, back to you, Yumiko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Bele. So there are a few questions. Um, this one, how do we support academics whose research has been focused on, on unsustainable technologies or practices for the last 30, 40 years, for example, to, for them to start building in uh, SD, sustainable development, into their teaching and their learning. I will share with you a few questions and then I will ask each panelist to pick a question and then uh, respond. Um, so there has been uh, various questions on the concept of ESD. How would you define in your own country? And ESD for 2030 is also about the disruptive ideas. What are the disruptive ideas in the field of 
training educators. This is a rather provocative uh, response and the can, uh, question. And can the platform be developed by ICBA for networking of tech teachers? I suppose this is for me. Um, and then what is the uh, email address of uh, Mr. Ostman? Maybe you could kindly write it on, the, on here. And uh, Norway, Italy, Belgium, Sweden, Australia. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry, this was an uh, answer. Uh, uh, okay, so those are the, okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ostman. So, uh, Professor Ostman, so a number of questions are coming, like uh, um, academia and so on. So I'm going to ask, uh, in the order of the uh, speaking, uh, Professor Marcello, would you like to respond to any of the questions very briefly? Over to you. <laughs> Professor Marcello Suarez uh, Orozca, Orozco. Okay, I think that uh, connection is not uh, very good. Can I go to... Uh, uh, Mrs. Graciela Mandolini, would you like to respond to some of the questions? Well, basically, I will come back to the question of how we can support academic training in the light of uh, the issues and problems that have been uh, studied over recent years and have led to the whole uh, concept of uh, sustainability. I think we have the opportunity here uh, because there is a lot of material, there is a lot of research, a lot of studies that have been done, and that's where we need to look. I think we need to delve into that to produce a critical analysis uh, so as uh, to develop a nature-friendly practice. So we are certainly trying to promote that approach in our teacher training. I know that there are lots of... Uh, teachers' unions uh, that have said we need to develop this kind of policy. Uh, for example, we have to contribute to, to knowledge building. And one possibility is to take all this information and organize a reflection process um, about these non-sustainable policies so that we can start from that that should be our starting point so we can rethink the content and the practices that we've had. At one area of great focus is to see everything in context. And on the basis of that context, uh, enable our teaching staff to talk about the experience uh, that they have, both them and the teachers, so we need uh, to organize an analysis on the basis of what is sustainability in each particular territory. So that should be what we, we should do, go into the analysis that's been done and develop a critical analysis. Uh, I hope that is... A, a satisfactory answer to your question. That's certainly what I think at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Graciela. It was very well answered. Now I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jihan Kamal um, the question on uh, disruptive ideas. ESD for 2030 is also about disruptive ideas disruptive ideas. What are the disruptive ideas in the field of teacher training? Would you be kind kind enough to dis respond to this question as well? Well, 
I can tell you that we think it's very important to reinforce the capabilities of our educators. We do stress the importance of ongoing training for our teachers and educators. Sometimes members of the teaching community require a little more support, uh, learning and information. Uh, those people need to be in permanent contact uh, with their pupils, of course, uh, but also with other educators uh, and with other members of the teaching community. Electronic platforms focusing on educators and teachers are very important. So we have to make sure that such systems and processes meet the needs of the education community and there have to be these possibilities for exchange between teachers and educators uh, we need to have this as an ongoing process ongoing support to teachers so that they can attain the necessary level of creativity so i think these digital platforms are of great importance we need to establish contact between the teachers and the learners in this way. And there's something else I'd like to mention. Our Egyptian Knowledge Bank, for example, it also contains a platform. So what this means is that there is a source of information for teachers when a teacher is looking for information, they don't always know where to look and they don't always look in the right places. So I think what we need is to have platforms tailored for teachers' needs so that there's a permanent exchange of knowledge and experience between them. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is very interesting. There is a knowledge bank library, uh, both in Egypt and also uh, no, uh, 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 Uppsala. That's um, uh, shared uh, ideas. That's wonderful. Now, Professor Marcello, I'm wondering whether you could answer to this question. How do we support academics whose research has been focused on unsustainable technologies or practices for the last 30, 40 years? for them to start building in uh, ESD into their teaching and learning? Thank you so much. This is a very important uh, question. And uh, the endeavors to um, support and to scaffolding the teaching and learning of uh, all our teacher education programs needs to flow from a series of principles that are widely, widely uh, accepted in the field of, uh, of education and in the field of uh, pedagogy. First, um, uh, the uh, fundamental gold standard for teaching and learning uh, in the domains pertinent to the sciences, the social sciences and the humanities, qua sustainable development, it, uh, it need to flow from first hands-on, face-to-face uh, teaching that is problem-based. What we have learned is uh, after 150 years of basic research in what we now call cognitive neuroscience, all learning is relational. It is in the context of three relational paradigms, behavioral engagement, cognitive engagement and relational engagement that all authentic teaching and learning flows. So we need to do a, a more uh, systematic and more focused work on retooling and upskilling the, the savoir-faire, the know-how, the practices of our teacher preparators and our teacher education systems so that we can get to a hands-on, project-based, face-to-face set of uh, learnings that will enable our teacher educators to fundamentally engage with children in the constructive ways that 
Again, we know from Durkheim, from from Dewey, uh, from the work of, uh, of uh, Jerry Bruner and, and Howard Gardner and so many others, that it is in the context of that relationship that is focused on a problem, that is problem-based, that teaching and learning about development, about sustainable humanity, about sustainability, about a sustainable future is uh, the, 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 the gold standard and should be our point of reference. There are enormous proof points. We have all kinds of practices, our colleagues in Sweden, our colleagues in the United Kingdom, our colleagues in Latin America, our colleagues, uh, really throughout, uh, we see pockets of, of excellence where we can build and where we can share best practices so that our teacher educators are ready for the existential challenge of the 21st century. We are in a path of unsustainable consumption, unsustainable development, unsustainable humanity. And this is the most fundamental challenge the world is facing today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marcello. That was, in fact, a very good uh, concluding remarks, I think. And so you started and you concluded. But uh, I have to say a few words. May, mainly thanking all the panelists and all the fabulous uh, participants. I see a lot of uh, very good um, contribution on what teachers need. This was really a very good session, I think. And I'm not going to uh, summarize this very rich uh, discussion because it was so rich. And I think every one of us will take something from this. There is already a request for uh, uh, connections and uh, partnership and so on. I think this is a, this was excellent because people want to connect, people want to relate. So, as it was said, this is really a 21st century uh, teaching and learning, and we are starting it with ESD. It seems that the, we have learned a very hard lesson this year and last year with the COVID-19, which made our lives and our professional lives, our personal lives changed. However, I think we also made a resilience importance in our work and then our life. So this was a very good learning, um, learning opportunities for us. And in this session, we had a variety of excellent ideas and experiences from USA, Sweden, Argentina, Cote d'Ivoire, and Egypt. This is really showing ESD and the learning and also capacity development of educators for uh, this ESD is a global issue. And the global issue has to be tackled globally. And we had an excellent panel. I personally enjoyed and learned a lot. So thank you very much for all the fabulous um, participants and the fabulous panelists. I would like to put my hands together for all of you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Gracias. 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 Shukran. Uh, Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And all these. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao tutti and welcome to Putting ESG into Action A. So we are here together, as you already know, to go into the session that focuses on concrete ESG action that can be undertaken by specific stakeholder groups around the five priority action areas of ESG for 2030. But within our tiny room, we'll be focusing mainly on empowering use, empowering and mobilizing use. So you all know that it's become um, very important um, to empower use to become agents of change and this is what's make it a key to achieve the sustainable development goal. Young people have the most creative, 
motivational and ingenious solution to tackle sustainability and its challenges. Youth all over the world have been increasingly active in demanding urgent and decisive charge, in particular to address the climate crisis. But demanding is something and achieving things is something else. And this made me think about what I um, heard yesterday from Andrea Schleider, Director of Education and Skills and Special Advisor on Education Policy for the Secretary General, who uh, showed some studies and diagram showing that the youth have the biggest motivation to make different, but they believe lower and less in their capacity to make impact. And this is why it's very important to empower youth. It's very important to work with them around making this difference because they have a lot of energy, a lot of tools. So education can empower young people with the values, the knowledge and the skills to take action. That is why youth is one of the priorities of the ESG for 2030 framework and roadmap for the next 10 years. So in this session, in fact, it will be divided into two main segments. So the first part will be presentation of good practices uh, and tools by the speakers. And then a second part would be a roundtable discussion on the way forward with your interaction. You can share with us any ideas or some, and we'll try with the time that we have to transmit these ideas to make our speakers' life a bit more difficult during this uh, one hour and a half altogether. So um, please join me uh, welcoming my, our five speakers. So we're going to have Miss Julia Althoff. She's the head of Mesh Collective. And then we're going to speak with Miss Anna Karen Proa Riboledo. And uh, she is a member of the UNESCO Climate Action Network and a young leader at the Adox Steering Group, and as well a young leader at the Earth Charter uh, International from Mexico. And then we're going to have a, a discussion with Mr. Thomas Gorniak. Director, Institute for Health and Environment, Slovenia, and Mr. Ia Kolowoli, Said Honkupunu. I hope I'm saying the name correct. Okay, Direct, Executive Director of Initiative for Development Integre Durable, EDED, Dubena. And then at the end, Ms. Malik Abidi, she's a US UNESCO Climate Action Network and part of the Adox Steering Group and Africa Matters Initiative in Tunisia. So, um, so without uh, delay, we're going to begin with fantastic uh, practices. So please join us from hearing from these uh, fantastic leaders and share with us um, your thoughts, even on the moment. And hopefully we'll try to interact later on uh, with, uh, with the speakers. So we're going to begin as first uh, with Ms. Julia Althoff. So thank you very much, Elish. Very happy to be here. Um, we can directly start with the Mesh Collective slide. Exactly. Because I want to short present you what we do. Mesh Collective, we do extracurricular youth education with focus on the digital spaces. And within the digital spaces, we believe in the power of social video education, didactic, didactic benefits of video content are enormous when it comes to learning because the optic nerve has like the fastest speed to our brain and video can transport emotions like no other non-analog vehicle. We also remember much more and longer audiovisual information than mere text-based information. That's important, but also there are pragmatic benefits as well because um, video is the most often shared and most often open content in the social web. And we want to reach as many people as possible, of course. So we at Mesh Collective in Berlin, a small team, we decode political or scientific language and prepare complex contact, content in an accessible way, considering the real life experiences and viewing habits of our young target groups. And for that, we ally at a very early stage with peers of the different target groups to understand their perspectives and needs and develop content that fits their living context. Because of course, me, over 40 years, I don't know the life realities and situations of these young people. So we early, early, early uh, of, yeah, ally with these peers. And these peers are far-reaching influencers that want to use their big outreach for societal change and usually do maybe makeup tutorials, you name it. But there's no topic 
how complex, however, if you go the extra mile that you cannot put up uh, in an eight minute YouTube video. So we publish on their existing channels on YouTube, Instagram, etc. We offer the influencers our journalistic expert, ex, um, exp expertise and a very broad network of experts, scientists, etc. in order to guarantee a factual and solid content, no matter how playful it might be put up. But when it comes to the look and the tonality of the videos, we give complete sovereignty to the channel owner, the influencers themselves, because no one knows better what their communities want, what their viewing habits are, and how to address them. The topics we tackle, you can see here, the formats you can see. So you can explain the electro garbage uh, dilemma within an animated zombie apocalypse. There's many possible ways to, to make it accessible. So the next slide would be um, one of our best practice examples. It's the hashtag Earth Overshoot Day that we did together with the German WWF. And um, the questions that we wanted to approach young people with are, as you can see here, what does it actually mean to live within the borders of our planet? Which are the largest factors that push climate change and endanger our wildlife? And what does all that have to do with my own everyday behavior and habits? So we wanted to open up dialogue on these specific topics. So if you can go to the next slide. What we did for that first the first instance, we did a, a analog, a real, a not digital, an analog workshop with young pupils, young peers to identify their questions, their topics and needs. And after that, we did an emotional cognitive workshop with the influencers where they had the chance to speak with experts and scientists, but also do a drama game um, to experience the exhaustion to, to experience what it feels like to have no resources left in order to feel the urgency and uh, for each of them to find their own individual access and topic. And after that, we did um, complex fact sheets together with the scientists that we broke down and made accessible for the influencers. We did treatments together, produced the videos, and then released the first of nine videos on Earth Overshoot Day 2018 and the last of the videos of the series on Earth Overshoot Day 2019. And the urgent question for us was how can sciences or science communications work on platforms like YouTube and how much science actually fits into a like eight minute video and how do we explain there? In the end, it actually even included a rap music video that even got awarded with the Fast Forward Science Award. So we were approved. Yes, it does work. You can do sciences in a playful way, even in a rap video on YouTube. Most important learnings, influencers can do more. They are more than just advertisory pillars. Um, communities can and can handle and want relevant societal content. Uh, the influencers got not punished by the communities with suddenly coming up with videos with scientific and political content. Um, sciences are more than just facts and dare to try out new communication measurements. And in the end, we got the change of mindset of the influencers, the scientists, and the communities. And I have a short trailer. Oh, the time is off. Am I right, Elisha? Do I have time here at zero zero? Finish. So I got the on www.meshcollective.te. They will put it in the chat, the organizationals. There's an English version of our homepage where you can look at all the cases and obviously also see the video of the Earth Overshoot Day. And yeah, I would have liked to present the second best case. I thought I can fit more in five minutes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Julia, for this uh, dynamic and multi-layered presentation. I'm sure everyone will go and look to the video and I'll be, I'll go and look at it just after. Uh, so just in order to go a bit faster with this, uh, this part, I'm going to leave directly the floor to Anna and uh, look forward to uh, also a new inspiring project and uh, transformation. I see Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Pretty excited. Well, um, I'm from Latin America, so I'm going to focus my presentation in Latin America. Um, well, um, I'm from Yogi UNESCO Climate Action Network, for, of course. Uh, the next, um, in, in the next slide, 
we will be um, presenting some examples of the actions that we have here in Latin America, where in Latin America, we are taking action from the perspective of climate education from local to global. And also from the understanding that just from education, we can, we can take well-informed actions, impacting in a positive way um, and leaving no one behind in order to fight against the social and economic injustices caused by the climate change here in Latin America, where it's um, impacting especially on our traditional agricultural and coastal communities who are the main people taking action to protect our resources. Um, the, the youth here in my region, for example, we are acting, uh, for example, with UCAN, we are identifying networks group or, or groups of young people who are already involved to articulate actions to support them and join efforts and act together from our communities to the world. Also, we are taking, we are working to translate scientific knowledge to an easier language to understand better climate change and the need to take climate action based on science because we recognize the importance of having this information accessible to everyone, no matter the age or the profession. With the Air Charter and the Youth in Climate Action Network of Costa Rica, we are working a lot in capacity building projects to get informed Asian and share this information, making projects of activism, education, or political in incidents. Also to articulate intergenerational and intersectoral actions. We identify a problem in our community and we start from there uh, from our community. And, and we used, of course, the Air Charter as a guide to have more sustainable lifestyles and, and more sustainable climate actions, of course. And besides, um, we are working hard to get close to our government and other organizations to assure the participation in decision-making process to highlight the young people's needs and perspective because it's our future that they are deciding on. Um, if you want to, to take a look of this air chatter, you can, you can look that web page that the organizer ha um, will um, we'll put in the chat. And also you can visit the UCAN web page to contact any member to get more information about your re region and how you can join us. Some concrete examples in, uh, in the next slide, we, we, can, we can see it. Uh, with the Art we have on online courses about education for sustainable development, for example, uh, leadership sustainability and ethics that it's available in English, Spanish and Portuguese um, and also Planet Mission. It's my, one of my favorites because it's with kids um, that in Spanish it's Mission Planeta, Heroes of the Earth, where we build a multicultural and free place to develop abilities, knowledge and projects to take action for sustainable development. And also in the next slide, we can see that um, we have Map Team, an incredible app uh, to see how the other uh, young people around the world are acting. And, and it's like an Instagram, you can choose, uh, you can just um, upload it and register and take an SDG or the Air Charter principle and you can see what the, the other young people are, are doing and you can join or just uh, take an idea to act. And well, with the Olden Climate uh, Change um, Network of Costa Rica, we have a podcast uh, that it calls Listen to the Climate in English, but in Spanish, it's <laughs> Escucha el Clima. Um, uh, I hopefully you can, you can listen it. And we share information uh, related to climate change in different topics. Um, we have been very involved also in the NDCs of Costa Rica participating um, to give our opinions, to give um, our perspective, young perspective, of course, and finally, um, we, we are pretty involved in Escazú agreement uh, to fight for the, the Costa Rica sign in the Latin American agreement for access to information and public participation and in, in environmental issues. And well, finally, I would like to share a, a pretty useful toolkit that UNICEF has launched here in Latin America in collaboration with UN activists uh, that it helped a lot to spread information about climate change uh, properly with the youth. So you can visit uh, the link there in the slide. It's pretty useful. I highly recommend it. And you can visit also Map Team in our podcast. And thank you so much. <laughs> it was pretty fast, <laughs> but I am up.
open to your questions and of course you, um, happy to be in touch with you. Thank you. Grazie, grazie, Anna. And it's fantastic on time. Um, it's interesting in, in, in such big conferences to discover new initiative that um, you are not aware of, especially in such global big world. So thank you for sharing this fantastic experience so far, Julia and Anna. And let's go directly to Thomas. Thomas, we are all ears. Uh, thank you, Elish. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm Tomasz Gorinc. I'm from the Institute for Health and Environment from Slovenia. As you can uh, recognize from the name of the Institute, we are working in the field of health and environment. So uh, maybe we can move on with the presentation. Um, Within our activities, we are focused to involve people, civil society, especially young people, youth, to use the knowledge and to transform it in the action or in practice. So in the context of uh, meaningful youth participation, this is really important for us. You can see uh, these ranks of youth participation. We are trying to, to, to uh, include them uh, in our activities as well. So um, I want to present our project, Partnership for Environment and Health, um, where we used special methodology, knowledge, attitude, practice. Um, and um, if you go forward uh, with the presentation, we will see that first step, knowledge uh, in this project uh, of Partnership for Environment and Health. So next, um, we asked young people in Slovenia what they think about the environment, what they think uh, about um, health. So we, we obtained uh, the data regarding the knowledge. We organized um, so the uh, interviews with uh, youth leaders. So with this, uh, let's say, big pool of information, we, we gathered key findings. And one of uh, them were definitely uh, that the knowledge, there are knowledge gaps among young people. Uh, and the second one was that there is a definitely big motivation, positive attitude, but at that time also a lack of activation and participation. You must know that this was done before Greta movement in Europe, but yes, it was really important and interesting. Uh, interesting. So we used that data to, um, to design further activities. So attitude and practice as a step of our project. So uh, if you go on, uh, as mentioned, attitude is really important. And um, so um, attitude towards clean environment, better health in order, uh, and also other sustainable development topics is important. So uh, it is, it's also influenced with different factors. Uh, also, um, and in the last years, um, you know, there is an important trend among young people. Uh, they are following influencers or young people want to be influencers. And yes, we designed this, this part of the practice that everyone can be influencer in the local environment, at least uh, in the field of environment and health. And therefore we organized an influencer campaign with a stand-up comedian in Slovenia to, to, uh, to, 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 to start communicating um, this uh, among Slovenian youth um, and here uh, we come to the last part of this uh, methodology, the practice, in, in my humble opinion, also the most important step. So uh, with the previous two steps, um, we gathered a lot of information. We, we, we try to know, um, we will try to boost the attitude towards, uh, towards the topic. And in this case of practice, we organized 12 local uh, youth Proactive cafes, um, where we uh, design these interactive activities in manner of criticize, suggest, and activate. Now, uh, as you know, um, everyone can everyone can criticize, and it's good to be healthy critical. Uh, but the next phase to suggest a solution is also important towards better a better change. So. Um, who knows the best than the youngsters from the local environment? And we ask them what they think, what they can improve in the field of environmental health. And um, they, they came with a really innovative and interesting ideas. Um, but maybe you will say, okay, these are all 
Uh, this is all theory, but the last step, activation step, activate to activate is really important. So we uh, gave also financial support and also mentors to the best ideas. So the young people uh, implemented them uh, in the local environments. So in the last 10 seconds of my presentation, we can move on to the last slide. And here are some national examples from green walls next to schools, um, uh, zero waste events on schools, workshop for kindergarten kids, uh, mobility, uh, mobile week activities, cycling breakfast to promote active mobility. So uh, the list uh, goes on and on and on. And I will stop here. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to continue this discussion in the next uh, round. So, back to you, Alish. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you a lot for this uh, as well. Another inspiring uh, example. And uh, this uh, takes me uh, to the fact really that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening all over the world. Uh, and we just need to dig and maybe hopefully we'll try to collaborate all of us together. So uh, without further delay, let's go directly to E. We're all ears. Say votre tour. Said? Yes, it's your It's your turn. It's your turn, Said. Thank you very much, uh, Eliesh. I'm from uh, Civil Society in Benin, and it's a pleasure for me to be able to share with you today some of the uh, experience that we have when it comes to involving youth uh, in the challenges uh, con concerned with uh, sustainable development and uh, uh, climate change. Next slide, please. So the very first aspect of our experience uh, uh, is what's occurring at the school level. Here, the idea is at the primary level and secondary level to go out into every school with a, uh, with a handful of youngsters uh, and uh, get them to have a, an immersive experience uh, in situ um, because we realize that with their training today that what they what they don't really have is is a true relationship with nature and the environment and after that each young uh, person um, is uh, called upon to form a club of youngsters around themselves so that they themselves can extend their knowledge and their experience and in other words you get a young uh, group of kids in the first school in in the school in the first instance who will then snowball out to other groups and after that we've got uh, uh, awareness raising issues and motivation concerning uh, environmental issues um, and um then we get the uh, the kids talking about uh, issues of sanitation in their in their villages in their towns in their schools uh, and uh, um, in particular looking at uh, the wetland environments uh, uh, and uh, these might be in the areas where they live so we're looking at the issues and potential uh, solutions on the very next slide what you can see is that these are some youngsters who are, uh, who have been convinced of the importance of these issues and they then in turn raise awareness among their parents and entourage. So they've got a little questionnaire that they first uh, fill in uh, and uh, each of these uh, kids, uh, once they come home from school, uh, and they, they go back home, their, uh, uh, their job is to start a conversation with their entourage. And then at the next session back at school, they give feedback on what they uh, learned from their entourage. Uh, and then the teachers select the best uh, um, uh, questionnaires uh, and look uh, carefully at the different uh, issues raised, the the solutions proposed and uh, then these children take it to the next level where they discuss potential solutions for environmental issues uh, and climate change. It's uh, important that what we're really trying to do is get uh, school children involved and yet uh, remember there are there are always youngsters under the age of 30 who might not be in the school, but who are also interested in these issues because they might work in, um, in farming, for example, and so they're interested in agroecology. And we try to get them on board as well. Our basic approach uh, is uh, firstly 
uh, on uh, immersion and sharing experiences. Now, as I said, firstly, they go and have a, a, an experience in nature and uh, and then it's up to the youngsters to serve as a relay and convey the messages that they themselves as well. And we've noticed that these youngsters have so much energy. So if you can just get a, a handful of youngsters on board when it comes to the environmental and uh, climate change issues, and then these youngsters themselves are so convinced they really do take ownership and they appropriate these ideas that they're delighted to share it with the people around them. So they actually uh, do their own promotion, if you like, uh, of... Uh, um, of, uh, of, of these ideas and they become ambassadors and they become uh, promoters of uh, eco-citizenship. And uh, the next level is that these uh, nature ambassadors will try and uh, uh, in turn convey the message to, uh, to their own uh, community leaders, to their parents, uh, to their school. And so the idea is to rain awareness, raise awareness among elected officials uh, and to promote uh, this eco-citizenship, uh, uh, not only in the, uh, in the school uh, environment, but also in the private sector, in, um, uh, in, in the private sector and uh, among elected officials. Now, with a couple of the good practices uh, uh, that we've been able to use, we've got a kind of toolkit. And then the upcoming challenge now is to take this further. We want to mainstream environmental issues into uh, school curricula and also at the secondary level. So that's where we're headed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saeed. I would just like to take out of all of this uh, one keyword, which is contagious transformation. Thank you for uh, sharing this information and this uh, fantastic project with us. And let's go directly to Malik. Malik, the floor Hello, is yours. Everyone. Super happy and thrilled to be joining you today and working collectively with different stakeholders. So basically, I'm from MENA region, which is will be my focus during the presentation, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's start with some facts. We all know that MENA region has like a quite huge population based on Wikipedia, which is 578 million. And that most importantly, youth and young children and young people represent more than half of this population, which is quite promising because they're becoming the potential um, a change agents. And also, we know that youth are variable assessed of their communities. Moving to the second slide, which will be honestly, I'll be highlighting a quite huge crisis in the MENA region for now, and uh, which is education crisis. We know that one in every five children in MENA region is not in school. And by 2017, it was estimated that 14.33 million, and more, mainly from Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, which are armed conflict areas, are out of school. And also after the pandemic, which, will, which was like more than 20 million. And this is all related because more than 8,000 school facilities is destroyed. You will be saying, why am I like bringing this information? Because basically youth empowerment and mobilization comes from these stories. And also like they are the key finders of, of the empowerment and the youth movement right now in the Middle East and North African region. This also will make us highlight more about the gender index, which is more than one, uh, like, one in five girls in the MENA region is not attending school, which will not allow us to even think more, let, let's say, about sustainable development. But still, it's still it's a motivation or an inspiration for us to work upon it. This will make me also move forward within the challenges that we're facing, especially after the pandemic in the next slide which are basically poor digital infrastructure. Within the pandemic, we discovered that our region is uh, not suffering, but we still have a huge problem with the digital infra infrastructure. And also young people are not participating enough in, in the poli policy making, and they're not accessible to even like bring an, ideas to, to the policy makers and decision makers as well. And if we look also from the other perspective, or let's say um, from another scope, we will find out that the resources as well are not very much like proven in Arabic. And we need quite of assistance to organize any related activities because we don't, we don't have that much resources, which leads to lack of awareness and initiative. 
we will be saying why this negativity or we're looking from that perspective. But this will also make us in the next slide appreciating the movements in the MENA region or let's say for, for so far they are making quite great impact in, uh, in our region by uh, creating podcasts such as Africa Matters Initiative. We're doing like podcasts about youth mobilization by bringing storytelling from people who raised up from small villages in, in North Africa and the Middle East. Also, we can see the SDGs camp that's influenced more than 5,000 young persons through boot camps and trainings. And it's quite amazing important to highlight that because more than 500 young people from this this boot camp really realize their sustainable ideas and through these trainings that are basically were uh, dedicated to speak about the 2030 global goals. Here I wanted also to highlight that even if there is a movement that it is not launched but it has a focus such as you can we believe that in you can for an example that we are having a vision for education especially regarding the climate action, sustainable development, because we aim to build climate literate young generation uh, by 2030, and also to provide people with uh, the right tools to, to respond to critical climate and social challenges. And this is also so far good. I wanted to highlight more and more movements in the MENA region that are working like nonstop for this, uh, for this crisis, especially like the climate and also social. But here, uh, I still believe that the crisis that we're having in terms of education is more important because it's also inspiring, but still we're lacking a lot of things. And here I had like a few tips from my story, for an example, which is in the next slide we'll be talking about, which is we have to act upon it and we need to promote for education and most importantly for sustainable development for our future generations, because there are many, many ways to get involved and promote these areas through small actions, because small actions really have on the long run, a huge impact. We can start just by through a local level, which is by community-based research. We can start with our main community, see what we are really lacking in terms of education, in terms of uh, like uh, infrastructure and everything and disseminate the information wisely within our community, as well as we start by making information accessible in languages. If we work by peers or by groups in our communities and try to translate into Arabic or from Arabic to French and English to make the information wide and wide, that would be absolutely amazing to have bigger impact. And last one, like last thing is basically to a network. Network is important because we'll be bringing more innovative ideas to your local and your grassroots. Agreement. Thank you, Malik. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, your presentation and thank you for sharing all this info. And I'm, I'm a bit pissed. You missed our uh, our work as well in the selection of what people are doing in the MENA area. I'm kidding. It's fine. Uh, ODD is absolutely <laughs> one of my favorite. Trust me. I know many alumnus from your side, so you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you, really thank you as well. It's very interesting that we had like a cover of different areas, uh, a variety of projects, uh, and now it's time to go to the round table. And I would really uh, I want to ask the attendees to share a bit their thoughts on the chat. We're gonna always see them, even uh, all the speakers could interact with you. Please ask, share your opinion, even the questions. So now what's gonna happen, I'm gonna ask uh, a question to one of the speakers, then I'm gonna go into a round quick answer from the others. So the first question is is mainly focusing on Julia. So what tools would you recommend to empower and mobilize youth for ESG? Three minutos. Okay, you can hear me, yeah. Okay, yeah, I made some notes on it because generally as I'm a practitioner in the digital realm, I can only evaluate on that with my specific experiences and learnings. But what I think that applies to both the analog and the digital space is that it's very important to create safer spaces in which communities can build up because complex and especially global climatic issues we all know can cause depression or feelings of depression, which makes one passive, can, can have a paralyzing effect. So if you find a community, you can keep up motivation. A community-based communication, again, offers dialogue, exchange, and empowerment. And we experienced this aspect with our communities we built on Instagram with another format I couldn't present today. It works really well. And to offer within this safer space also positive examples and realistic options of action and work with peers for identification and context to the target group's individual living situation and reality. So never forget the peers from the beginning. That's what 
my um, learning would be. Thank you, Julia. So um, please, the other speakers, I'm going to go with a round. If you can give me a phrase, each one of you, as a response to the same question. So we're looking how the way forward. So this is what we want to focus on. So in your opinion, what tools would you recommend to empower and mobilize youth for EST in the upcoming 10 years, if you want? Thomas, what do you think? Well, I, I believe that um, from my, I mean, my opinion and from my experiences, um, I believe that um, comprehensive uh, approach is really important. Um, I personally like tools and the recommendations. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the tools that you really ask young people what they know, what they think. I'm really a person of meaningful participation this way. I remember from the years, really powerful uh, TEDx talk uh, with the name, uh, shut up and listen. Uh, because usually um, when we are talking about educational tools, we are just doing from the one way process. We are teaching, 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 teaching. What I like from the uh, non formal education is that it's a two way process. Uh, and um, this is my opinion on how to empower also young people and how young people can also inspire others. So okay. this would be it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So let's try to be concise, especially, you know, because we have three minutes for the five other people. Uh, so Anna, what do you think? Yeah, I think just um, get informed, um, share this information and uh, networking, <laughs> share your story and networking with other young people to take action. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, qu'est-ce qu'on pense, Saïd? What do you think, Saïd, about this? What are the um, best tools? Uh, what tools would you recommend to uh, mobilize uh, young people? Well, on the basis of uh, uh, our, our hopes, I think it's first of all uh, camps, nature camps for young people. That would be the first tool because those camps can raise awareness in young people about nature. That is, make this concept concrete. The second tool, uh, you know, that young people love games. And pe most of them spend time on the internet at times, they, they waste their time. So it would be good, therefore, to take these uh, game gaming tools or the traditional games that existed uh, and integrate uh, the environment and climate change into these games. The th another thing is the relationship between generations to put a young person in contact with an adult who will speak to him or her about how uh, the neighborhood or the city was before, that would help to raise awareness in young people and, uh, and to motivate them to defend the environment. Thank you. Can we please be a bit shorter? If you have a phrase to respond to this question, just not to be incorrect. Thank you for the question. So basically, one of the greatest tools for me is to have a, you know, a non-systematic and coordinated manner in terms of uh, engaging and empowering youth. I'd love to have a tool which is uh, which is going to be coming from a personal perspective from your community. Having community-based research or having community-based stories is an amazing tool to create a great uh, like movement or projects later on because this, this is coming from real stories, coming from uh, a background that is filled with pro issues, but the young people really worked on them. So Thank having you. a tool that is uh, coming from youth and, uh, and implemented by youth is really important. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, are you ready for question two? Anna, if you could modify or add a new SDG after living through a pandemic such as COVID-19, which would it will be? Well, <laughs> it's an amazing question. Well, I don't think that it's necessary to add another SDG. We haven't developed, developed enough efforts to achieve the SDGs that we already have. Uh, but the pandemic came to remind us that we must work very hard 
to achieve them. We must remind that all the SDGs are connected and that's the key to develop actions to recover us uh, to the crisis caused by the pandemics also and, and, and build a new normality that allows to prevent other crises like this. And I am meaning uh, about health, economic, social and environmental crisis because we have to keep in mind that uh, not only economics are involved in this situation, the COVID also is related to climate change and the exploitation of our biodiversity. Uh, um, actually, 70% of, of recent epidemics uh, outbreaks have started with deforestation, according to the World Health Organization. So while I aren't um, aware that we are a system and everyone has a responsibility for our planet and every action has to consider the environmental, social and economic aspects, we will face more consequences that drive us to a crisis. So we must to start to change our rest strategies and systems as well. So no, no SDG for spiritualidade? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that I mean, I think that with the SDGs that we already have, it's like the, the, the perfect um, start, you know? Uh, of course, we can, um, we can be as specific in this kind of things. Of course, the spirituality, it's pretty important because it's from the spirituality that we can um, have a more uh, um, idea of take care of our planet. Of course, it's pretty important. But I think that that it's not about to add another, but work in the, in the SDG that we already have uh, from different perspectives and from our communities because all, uh, all the realities are different. So we have to keep in mind that, that the other, uh, the, the other contexts are pretty different than all, all, our context, you know? Thank you, Anna. So, guys, so for each one, 30 seconds, I'm going to do the round of the table, per favor. Okay, so I'm going to begin uh, uh, with uh, Malik. Thank you very much for the question, Sridi. Uh, you know, it makes you think. But honestly, from my side, if I do it like modify or add, honestly, I'll be combining three uh, main uh, SDGs, which is health and well-being, quality education, and reducing inequalities. Because this pandemic revealed a lot. We, we know that many communities are still not equal and they're still not get, getting their rights. Still also our, the health crisis is just crazy. We, 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 like through the news, we can see everything's going on. Many people are not even accessing to hospitals like within this pandemic, people lost their jobs, uh, like uh, education is, is on pause. So I think if we combine these three uh, SDGs together and we work on them like massively, that would be absolutely amazing to work on it. Thank you, Malek. Uh, Said, question pense? 30 seconds. Oui, uh, yes, I think that we shouldn't add a new SDG. The pandemic has helped us understand that we have to work in uh, new ways. We have to strengthen the way we are uh, striving to achieve the different SDGs and not treat them in isolation. We need more synergies and we have to bring the different actors to take a holistic approach rather than to be closed and off in their own sectors. Thank you. Julia, okay, you, you're the head of the world now. You have <laughs> the power to add an SDG. Would you yeah. like to add and which is it? Okay, I don't totally feel qualified to answer this complex <laughs> question, but what I think was totally missing in this global and societal crisis was the focus on the youngsters, the lack of education, the lack of identification, the lack of movement. And they were in the first months because of overwhelmed, every, every government was overwhelmed, totally lacked or, or missed out in the whole game. And they are the ones who will carry it economically, mentally, etc., for a long way to go. And they were in the first months and months and months, not on the agenda anywhere. And I think this is a scandal. And so I think the focus with the societal, global, climatic, whatever crisis is the focus on the youth in a spe specific, specific such a moment. God, I get emotional. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you, Julia. Thomas, what do you think? 
actually, uh, in my opinion, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I believe that such as this structure is fine. And I see this structure as a really good response to, to, to the pandemic, actually. I, uh, I, I wouldn't change anything, in my opinion, because the, 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 the structure is just fine. Uh, the implementation in this sense is important, and uh, the the pandemic was just uh, provoked may, maybe with, with such a disease. So that's it. Oh, we're trying to be critical, guys. Come on, let's be a bit more critical and distort a couple of things just for the sake of uh, of the thing. So let's go for the question three. Thomas, you're gonna stay with us, per favor. After okay. a pandemic such as COVID-19 or others, hopefully none will come. What are some of the biggest challenges of today and how can ESD help in that? Tres minuto. Yeah, I think uh, I will be brief, but uh, I, I, I see that this pandemic is a huge disruption is the SDG process. Um, uh, and also, in, for example, uh, my colleagues here uh, ex um, mentioned education. School, many schools were closed for many times. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this is big disadvantage for young people. But this is one aspect. There are others as well. We, uh, right? So, uh, and I see after the pandemic, one of the biggest challenge will be to fill the gap. Uh, and but this gap uh, must be filled and must be addressed um, coherently. And. I believe that as the uh, um, education for sustainable development is also a key. Um, so how we can implement and how we can learn to respect the planet boundaries and change our modus operandi or our business as usual in more sustainable living. This is also related to the pandemic. Well, that, that was... Um... That was concise and straight to the point. Thank you for that, Tomas. So let's do our two. In this case, Julia, what do you think? I was uh, trying to, to think really quick on that. I don't know how can ESD help, but I think one of the quickest uh, or biggest challenges is, like I said before, the um, social, economic, and psychological after effects because the people all around us got very tired and paralyzed and to get this back going to be up for the next chapter is a big challenge. So, so you, you don't see um, any, any specific way to make ESD boost this tiredness away from the people when you say that? Yeah, yeah, I, I see it, but I cannot now concrete on the spot name one. Okay, okay. Thank you. Malik, what do you think? Actually, this is a great question. Basically, many challenges faced us like after COVID-19, but I will always focus on education because, you know, if we worked more on this before, we wouldn't have been in this kind of cri educational crisis right now after COVID. Um, I believe that ESD can work greatly on that uh, and like in collaboration with uh, its stakeholders and um, like Everyone, if we work uh, hard, hardly on that, it will be amazing because it's also when we focus on education, we will find out also that there are many people who will be getting their rights and we will be more equal. So, yeah. So you think education will make people equal? Yeah, exactly. Because knowledge is power. And when you get that power and share it with everyone, you will be absolutely equal to everyone in terms of that. Okay. Um... Uh, Said, qu'est-ce que tu penses? What do you think, Said? I'm going to answer the question by asking another question. Have we really learned the lessons uh, uh, from COVID? And for me, the answer is no, because we are, are hurrying to redevelop our economies and to go even further in economic development, whereas I think the pandemic has given us an opportunity to take stock and to see how we can see things and think about things differently. If I look at the SDGs, how we can reach them differently. Some people said that education is fundamental. For example, we've seen in Africa that it is very difficult 
to get people to keep their social distancing. So I think it's fundamental to emphasize the question of education and especially to include digital technology, which is really underused in our educational systems. Another very important thing that I would like to draw everyone's attention to is that in this, uh, uh, in this rush, uh, headlong rush to new economic recovery, uh, do, shouldn't uh, we be careful about uh, the use of carbon and, and, uh, and climate change? So what are the strategies that we need to develop? That's the sort of question we should ask ourselves. Thank you very much. Anna, so, so after such a big pandemic, what are the biggest challenges of today? And how can ESD directly contribute and help in solving it? Well, itself, ESD, it's essential um, to implement strategies, uh, drive us to, to, to recover us after these pandemics. Of course, it, uh, uh, good access to the, the health services, but I would point on education as well. Uh, we are in a moment that all education, um, at least in Latin America, is, is digital. So we have a pretty big gap on this. So after the pandemic, we have to work on um, pretty hard to fill this very big uh, gap, digital gap, but education mainly gap. Um, it, it's very interesting. Uh, it's been two days uh, in this conference, and now we're speaking a lot about the digital uh, uh, shift. And maybe if we have time at the end, we're going to go through a, a specific question about that. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to go to question four. And this question is uh, addressed to Said in first and then to all of you. Donc, Said, comment les organisations peuvent-elles intégrer les the organisations? integrate the SDGs into the intergeneration dialogue and community planning and decision-making processes. Uh, now, if you ha had been following a presentation, I think that that's one of the approaches I raised. That is, first of all, to put young people uh, in a situation where they can share their experience when it comes to nature. But the other essential aspect is to involve young people in different decision-making uh, bodies. For example, we, we've been discussing young parliamentarians, but we have to go even further. Our experience has to do with raising the awareness amongst uh, local elected officials, thanks to um, young people. That is, the young people will bring their messages to the attention of the uh, local decision makers. It's the young people who, who, who make those points. That's a fundamental element. Another very important thing is that we are in, in uh, de decentralizing uh, decision making and the, uh, and the uh, local development plans don't take much account of their uh, youth. So therefore, youth should be integrated as a stakeholders, as full stakeholders. Uh, other, uh, that is, the young people should be involved in local development and greening. We, for example, we've created environmental clubs run by young people uh, in uh, the classroom, in the schools. And our goal is to go beyond that. These young um, environmental clubs, these young people who are called nature's ambassadors, will try to defend everything that the elected officials are attempting to do at the departmental or the municipal level when it comes to protecting the environment. Finally, the essential tool that we set up is an evaluation of the environmental dimension before uh, uh, be, be before a local official steps into office. And then at the end of his term or her term of office, it's the young person who's going to evaluate his or her environmental work. And this way we can show that young people can be involved in this is different decision-making processes. Let me just um, uh, expand upon that. And let me ask you, do you think that uh, what you've shared with us can be uh, it's transmitted everywhere in the world, or is it just something for a specific community? 
where uh, the generations accept speaking together, or whereas in other places that wouldn't work. Uh, I mean, where there's always one generation that doesn't want to share power with another. Yes, uh, we've also got this in Benin. But I think you've you've hit on a critical point here. We talk about this, uh, um, remembering that it's the child who transmits the message to their parents. So it's important to have people listening to their children. And it's only after that first uh, step, uh, this intergenerational step, that you actually move out broad, more broadly, into the wider community. Um, and then you've got uh, you've got to ensure that you've got those intergenerational spaces. Uh, and so that it's really the family that's at the core of this. Um, so when we talk about uh, education these days, we sometimes forget the absolute crucial importance of the family. Thank you very much, Saeed. So, uh, Anna, you're facing me now on the cam. So, so let me ask you the question. Um, how can organizations integrate ESG perspectives into intergenerational dialogues, community planning and decision making processes? Well, um, just, well, I think that it's, uh, it has like two parts of this. Uh, for youth, just fight to have uh, these spaces because it's not easy, but just keep, keep trying <laughs> to got it. And for the organization, just think about it's the future of the youth that they are deciding on. So you have, you must to have uh, this uh, perspective in, in, in everything <laughs> because you are discussing about the lives of the other people, the, the future generation, just keep in mind that and include the, the youth because the youth really can and the youth really can, can give uh, really good tools and really good perspectives about. Um, so yeah, that, I think that that's it. Thank you, Anna. We all believe that the youth can, but let's see if the youth believe that. Uh, so what do you think, Julia? Um, oh, I'm, I'm on. Okay. Um, we are actually developing at the moment a format, which is an intergenerational debate club, so to say, because we saw it was Fridays for Futures. We saw it now with Corona. It's a very different power relations and perspectives and yet such a big inter dependence, but actually the dialogue between like the, the very young people and the baby boomers is not really taking place. So we, we have a format where we uh, bring these together. And I think that is missing because with um, Fridays for Future, we saw that the young people with also the election programs did not feel represented, mirrored, or also by the choices the baby, baby boomers did in the elections. The future of the young people were not um, a cause. And at the same time with Corona now, we challenge the young people to give up their young life for more than one and a half years to protect the elderly. And of course, many of them were protesting and saying, what the fuck? Yeah, you were not interested in our future all along. And now we, you're taking, you're stealing one and a half years of us. So I think these different power relations and interdependencies that we saw so clearly in the last two years with Fridays for Future with Corona, we need to make uh, dialogue rooms um, with yeah, intergenerational exchange and bring, and we're, we're building one right now, a format, a social video format. Okay, thank you, Julia. It seems Nora was reading as well your mind and she was speaking about political level, lowering the voting age to give more voice to the youth. Um, uh, Thomas, mm -hmm. what about yeah. you? Yeah, by the way, quick comment, Julia, well said. Um, and what I want to add as well, um, I agree with Dana, uh, when uh, she was also mentioning this integration process, I think from the um, organization perspective, I think this integration should be everywhere in all segments of organizations. Um, in my opinion, um, to integrate education for sustainable development must be included also in strategic planning because this is a long road. And uh, I think uh, also each organization should have a strategic, uh, strategic document where is um, education for student development integrated. Uh, th that's it for now. Uh, Thomas, who would do that? Who need to do that? 
I think the if we are talking about young uh, youth organizations, I would say youth leaders uh, who are in charge of youth uh, youth organizations. I believe that young people ha uh, they have capacities to do that. I think that was shown also uh, in pre-corona -corona, uh, period with uh, Fridays for Futures. I think. Uh, the young people are capable of doing that. Uh, I think the young people understand uh, complex problems uh, from a sustainable uh, perspective. And I think, uh, yeah, to be the leaders of their own and their own organizations as well. Thank you, Thomas. Malik, how do you see this happening in the, okay. in the uh, Arab yeah, world or even all over the world, if you want? Okay, so basically, I just wanted to highlight that ESD perspectives are not coming uh, like from our imagination, they're coming from our reality. So if we look um, like in depth, we will see that grassroots organizations, for an example, are already putting ESD perspective into their plannings, into their structures as well. But here I will be adding my uh, my point, like my uh, vision or my opinion to uh, Julia's ones, which is intergenerational debates. It's really important to work on that because when we are speaking about sustainable development, it's not at the same notion as we have as Gen Z, not like uh, the other generation. No. So having that debate is really important to, to fill the gap that we're having in between and also uh, for like organizations to have like uh, better tools within the time to work on that. So organizations have a lot of work to do, but let's focus more on the intergenerational debates. Thank you, Malik. And stay with me, per favor, because uh, the last question is directed to you. Question number five. How does ESD empower young people to change the way they see, think, and work towards a sustainable future? Okay, this so is it's really interesting. Question. I want to see the way they see, I want to see the way they think, and the way they work, and what is a sustainable future for them, if you may. If you can okay. show us this, thank you. Okay, so we all know that the concept of sustainable development basically emerged as a response to growing concern about human-like society impact on the natural environment. And we know that ESD since 2005 is still committed to that. So basically, I believe that there are many ways uh, to empower young people to change the way they see, think, and work towards a sustainable future. So for like on a first level, let's mention the whole school approach. Personally, I do believe that this approach is pretty important to put ESD into action because it presents a significant opportunity for the formal education sector. And since we know after COVID, we are really in an educational crisis. And I repeat that always on the daily. And not only it can enhance the environmental performance of schools for like uh, and as institutions that is providing young people uh, the tools needed and the resources, but also it can raise the quality of education and build more sustainable future. And here also, uh, I would like to highlight one of the uh, initiatives that I love the most from this for this approach, which, which is equal school programs that it was invented in uh, in Europe and now it's going around the globe while affecting more than fifty thousand young person uh, through like uh, getting resources and working towards a sustainable future. But also, I'd like to highlight a non formal approach, which is basically uh, through uh, the structure of non governmental organizations, are focusing more also on the individual advocates of ESD. Here, it's like uh, not a systematic uh, systematic uh, or coordinated manner, but it's more like uh, coming from a personal perspective for sustainability through like trainings that are coming from local uh, and small communities. And at the same time, it's shown that these leaders will develop sustainability within uh, their communicated uh, communications are more motivated than coming from uh, an approach that is more like more coordinated from the government, if you got my point. So far, this is like my answer. I'd hope like to, to have others on the move as well. Well, we're looking forward to uh, both of us, it seems. Uh, and we're going to go move directly to, to Saïd. Uh, Saïd, qu'est-ce que tu penses? Comment le DD permet-elle aux jeunes? what do you think? Uh, how does ESD enable young people to change the way they think? Well, when we look back a little, you realize that um, when we as adults look back, um, some of us haven't actually been very successfully made aware of environmental issues. Why? Well, basically because it didn't come to us early enough. 
It's really simple. What we need is to do things earlier. We need to think of these youngsters as future adults. And the very first things to do, as Malik was saying a moment ago, it, the, the very first thing is to start from the basics right early on and go back to the to those very young categories uh, of uh, of the new generation and, and remembering that the uh the school environment is is all very well but that's a, a, an environment that's quite separate from uh, the very first thing which is the family and when you think about the potential uh, uh, that uh, um, that they have to be leaders in the future, and you think about every single category of young person, um, then you really spread the, the net broadly, and that's what we're trying to do. And the second thing is to think local, involve youngsters at the very local level, and this is not widespread enough currently. You need to reach out to young people wherever they are and get them on board. And the third thing is, uh, is the sharing or or mixing of ideas and experience um, and that's what we need to do how many games um, uh, how, how, how many um, how many games do youngsters play that are also played by their elders um, uh, remember that if you want to have an intergenerational mixing uh, then you've got to find centers of interest so that bring them all together Thank you very much, Saeed. We'll stop there just to try and give a, a chance to others to answer the questions. Anna, what do you think? Anna? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right now. Um, well, yeah, I, I think that I agree a lot with Malek <laughs> also. And, and yes, I think that um, through the S ESD, we can have a, a, a big perspective of our realities and that we are realities are pretty different and we have to to act from there uh, just um, and from the information so the ESD give us the information the information that about the, the environment but the economic and the uh, and the society as well and how uh, the, these three things are pretty connected and how we can act uh, from environment, but impacting a lot uh, the society yeah, positive, uh, in a positive way, of course, and the economic as well. Uh, so I think that in that way, uh, the ESG empower us. And um, I agree with all that uh, uh, my colleagues are saying as well. <laughs> Bueno, Anna. Um, uh, Julia, can I can I hear from you uh, a quick answer? I just have the three keywords, which is uh, via knowledge transfer, give the chance to uh, locate within societal happening, and thus um, become more resilient because you have a standing, a stableness, and that can trigger a sense of self efficiency, which in turn allows solidarity. So it's the three keywords, resilience, self-efficiency, and solidarity. Thank you. Thomas. Yes. Um, Malek said before that education is a power. Definitely. And here we are again. We are talking about empowerment of young people, but not just this uh, theoretical knowledge, etc. but no, this real uh, knowledge that gives the, uh, that give the wisdom. Uh, why I'm talking about the wisdom, uh, if I uh, give a political example, um, political cycles, for example, are shorter than environmental problems, and um, the wisdom is necessary to, 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 to have the, uh, to, to have this no to wisdom and knowledge to, to guide the society um, in such way, that, uh, that sustainability will be achieved and the next generations will have quality lives as well. Okay, guys, we still have five minutes. It's time to close, but um, uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you a question that we received from the Q&A and I really want from each one of you 20 seconds, please, guys. And because I have a last round of very experimental uh, thing. So we have the question is, we have learned in the young reporters for the environment that positive story empowers people more than negative messages. Example, about climate change. How do you see youth can play an influencer role 
in media to involve others to take actions. How to empower more youth into taking actions. 20 seconds, per favor, each one. Julia, I'll begin with you. You began with such topic. Yeah, it's it's already happening with formats like um, Ozone. The most important thing is finding the right storytelling for environmental issues. It has to do with mood. It has to do with lifestyle. And it has to give realistic, like I said before, options of action. The key message is you're not alone and your action matters. And it's about identification. But that's already happening with formats like Ozone on Instagram that we're doing. Thank you, Julia. Thomas. I believe social media can help a lot. We are we are uh, living in a society of influencers, but from the influencer perspective, w what kind of influencer are you? Uh, this is important. And yeah, storytelling is important in this sense as well. Um, so yeah, this will be more or less it. Anna. Well, I agree with Julia and Thomas as well. And I think that we have to choose the, the, the correct uh, history, but not only uh, through social media, that it's pretty helpful, of, of course, but with our community as well, with, with our uh, with our friends, uh, friends of school or job, uh, we can share our histories and, and we can impact on, on them to take action. Fantastic. Uh, Said? Said, did you hear the, the question? Yes. Um, I think basically it's life stories that really inspire people to make a difference. Okay, Malik. I just love the topic of social media and influencing and all that kind of stuff. But I believe that storytelling is important and we have to bring both sides to the social media. It's not just always about positivity, but we also have to bring the dark side of our lives and bring in it as a story to, to showcase it to the world and see that people come from these backgrounds and they really have power and they can mobilize others as well. So um, storytelling and this, this kind of subject is really important and I believe that we should showcase both sides and that's it. In a balanced way, can we say? Yes or no, Malik? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ask you a last question and I need just from you an answer yes or no. Would you like to see education shifting completely into um, uh, a digital in the near future? Yes or no? Julia? No. Thomas? No. Malik? No. <laughs> Anna? No. <laughs> Said? No. So now there is a lot of problem, a lot of problem. There'll be a lot of problem. There's a lot of discussion to take place because it seems uh, a lot of people are pushing towards that. Um, uh, so you have a lot of work to, to promote the opposite of that if you don't believe in it or if you believe in it, how to find the balance in between these two because it's already a question to be uh, addressed in the near future. I really want to thank each one of you. We have one minute, 15 seconds. Uh, if each one can give me one keyword, how could you... Uh, summarize this session for yourself in person. How did you find it? How, whatever you felt, you, you, you have something that caught your eye or your mind. Just one keyword, each one of you. I'm going to begin with Saïd. Les jeunes plus en avant dans tout ce que nous faisons. Ça, Children at the forefront. Okay. <laughs> Merci, Saïd. Anna. In one word, right? One, one word. Okay, inspiring. Malik? Empowering, which is basically the title. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas? Inspiring, definitely. And Julia? Dynamic. Dynamic, fantastic. I really want to thank you uh, and have a wonderful experience changing the world. We all need each other and I hope we can find a way to collaborate all of us together because I can see the interconnectivity between a lot of these projects. So thank you again. I have an experimental week and enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you're tired behind this laptop, stretch a bit <laughs> and ciao. Thank ciao, you, ciao. Anish. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Good to Cheers. see you. Good to connect with all of you. Take care. Ciao, ciao. A panel of four renowned people from four different countries.
And with these speakers, we will explore how can mayors and elected officials use ESD tools for achieving the 17 SDGs and making cities and communities more inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Cities and communities are key centers of thought and action for education and learning about sustainable development. That is why this is key for this World UNESCO conference. It is in the community where meaningful transformation and transformative actions for sustainable development are most likely to take place. Therefore, empowering people to voice their demands for a sustainable future and bring, bring about changes in their communities is a key focus of ESD. We will learn about how to move forward with this uh, in today's se session and excellent panel. Let me introduce the speakers of today. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Mrs. Sowad Abderrahim. She's the mayor of Tunis, the capital of Tunisia. Uh, this is the UNESCO city of crafts and folk art. It is also part of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. She is the first woman to serve as a mayor of Tunis, was elected in 2018. Uh, welcome, Mrs. Abderrahim. We also have the pleasure to have Mr. Felipe de Sousa Costa from Sao Paulo Municipal Secretariat of Education of Brazil. It is interesting to know that the current Sao Paulo Municipality curriculum developed in 2017 is aligned with the SDGs. Also, the city's university called UMAPAS has been implementing for many years the Earth Charter in Action program, where they train citizens to become social environmental urban agents. Welcome, Mr. De Souza. We also have the pleasure to have Dr. Yonggu Shin, Executive Director of Gwangyu International Center, based in Republic of Korea. Dr. Shin, is also Senior Advisor for Human Rights and International Affairs of Guangyu Metropolitan City. And we also have the pleasure to have Mrs. Elzbieta Volosinska Bisniewska, Director of Education and Geo Information of UNEP, GRID, which is the Global Resource Information Database of Vars Vos Center in Poland. So this session will have two parts. In the first part, the speakers will make a presentation about good practices and tools. Each speaker will have five minutes to present. And in the second part, it is a round table discussion on the way forward with audience interaction. So you all have the, the possibility to interact with our great speakers and between yourselves. Uh, I remind the speakers that there is a clock in the platform to let you know when your time is coming to an end. So the first panelist of today is Ms. Soad Abderrahim. Uh, so the floor is yours. Shukran lakum, Sayyidati wa astada zumalai Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank all participants and colleagues and wish you a good afternoon. I'm very pleased to thank UNESCO, first of all, for giving me this invitation to speak today. I'd also like to thank UNESCO for this very important initiative, which is very timely and we welcome it because it's extremely useful particularly when it comes to what cities can contribute in the area of education but also in other areas through which we can strengthen education for sustainable development our country 
and our city have undergone several historical eras. Since 1958, our municipality was constituted and we were among the first Arab country to constitute this municipality. The city of Tunis has also given women the right to vote, as well as other rights since the 1950s. So at country level and at city level, we have been able to advance the necessary democratic transition through elections on the basis of a republican democratic regime while focusing on the importance of local communities. We attach major importance to local communities. And we believe that this is a priority in order to undertake the necessary actions at local level, whether it's for economic development, social development, or other forms of development. As was mentioned by a moderator, I was elected in 2018 to uh, take up office at the head of the Tunis municipality, and I'm the first woman to have been elected uh, for this position. We have achieved major democratic um, progress, but we've also focused on the need to preserve our traditions and our culture. Now, when it comes to the preservation of our culture and our traditions, we have placed this issue at the heart of the actions that we've been undertaking at the local level. This is not something new, it's something that has been going on at the level of the Tunis city for several years now, and we've actually received several awards at national, regional, and international level. For example, we received the Jean-Paul Anny Prize Award for being one of the major heritage cities. And in 2017, we also received the UNESCO Prize. And in 2019, the city of Tunis was named, among other Arab cities, the major Islamic city. And we have always endeavored to preserve our heritage along with our traditions to ensure that our city continues to be a city at the forefront when it comes to development, but also the conservation and preservation of heritage and traditions. For us, this is extremely important so that we may move forward and advance our development, economic, social, and uh, cultural development. First of all, by targeting the residents of the city, but also so that we can become an example for other Tunisian cities or other cities. 
whether it's at the urban level, archaeological level, or architectural level, while also developing the field of the arts and traditional professions within our city. We have been working to attract the necessary qualifications and talents to ensure this. We are very aware that in order to achieve success in these actions, we need to focus on developing our social tissue, our social networks, and therefore, we are fully committed to engaging with the Mediterranean region and the, at country level, on an artistic level, archaeological level, in collaboration with other cities in the Mediterranean region. For example, the cooperation we have uh, launched with the city of Rome. The ancient part of the city boasts archaeological buildings which are truly unique and we endeavor to preserve these buildings, to preserve their unique character and we've been undertaking these actions Mrs. in order to prevent ben urban Abdel development Rahim. from Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Abderrahim <laughs> sorry your, your time has come to an end uh, maybe do you have something to conclude thank you so much I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed to collaborating with us and in our actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Ben Abderrahim, this is, has been uh, wonderful to hear you. What a pleasure. And now uh, we continue with Mr. Felipe de Sousa Costa. The floor is yours. Good morning. Can I share my slides? Or some, is someone? I think someone will share your slides. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so good morning. I'm Philippe Costa from Municipal Secretary of Education of Sao Paulo. And there I'm a curriculum department director. And today I, I'm going to, to introduce to you some of our practices about uh, SGS, SDGS uh, here in Sao Paulo. Can I share the third slide, please? Okay, thank you. Here, I'm going to introduce to you some of our numbers. Uh, here in Brazil, we are the greatest uh, city. And here we have some number of our, of our, uh, of our municipal education here. And here we have uh, 1 million of enrolled students and 85,000 education professionals. We have some challenges here, of course, when we talk about uh, to practice the SDGs. And here uh, we have some of our numbers, which is transforming practice. And I, I want to introduce for you. And uh, the next, please. Okay, so in this slide, you can see 
some of our uh, works uh, involve uh, uh, SDGs in the city in our curriculum, uh, which has the, the premise to, to integrate some inter integral education for sustainable development. And in cooperation with UNIS Brazil, we produce 24 curriculum documents for all segments of education, link the different areas with the seven SDGs. And these documents, for example, allows the track of fundamental objectives to deal with nowadays challenges. And here you can see some photos of our documents. And for all our segments, like a, a child education, elementary school, high school, special education, and youth and adult education, we have a document which says a curriculum, a core, where uh, our, where our students and teachers can see and work with all the seven SDGs. Uh, the next, please. Okay, and to put to put in practice the the SDGs in our curriculum, we also produced some materials for students and guidance for, for teachers who put the seven SDGs practice in all segments of public education in our city. And here we have some links and some materials that we produced here. For example, the first one, is the guidelines for sustainable development goes in the city curriculum. Uh, our curriculum is called Curriculo da Cidade, city curriculum. And we have also produced some materials for students uh, to science, Portuguese, and mathematics textbooks, where uh, for our elementary school, where we integrate and articulate uh, the curriculum learning objectives, we have here some abilities and the seven SDGs. We also have guideline, guidelines for teachers about migrant people and guidelines for teachers about native peoples, indigenous specifically, and a website with proposed activities for elementary school where students and teachers can see the relation between uh, our abilities in our curriculum and SDGs. And here we have some links. I think the, uh, after this is going to be for you. The next, please. Okay. And here we have some photos uh, where you can see the SDGs in the city of Sao Paulo. Here is a photo from our school, which is called MF Escola. Uh, Arthur Azevedo. In here, you can see some uh, uh, project from this school, which is to paint the wall of the, the school. And here we have some teacher training, training for trainings, and some spontaneous proposal from school units. And the last one, please. The next, please. Okay. Uh, ODS or SDGS. ODS in Portuguese, we have a project called uh, ODS Mediators uh, with Youth Press Students, where they do some, some activity related to, to youth uh, and press, to youth press with students and teachers. And here you can see some of these uh, actions. And that's some of our actions uh, relating SDGs in practice in our city and where you can see some of this development. And that's it. I think it's the last slide with my contact. Thank, and you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Felipe de Sousa. This is very interesting. I will look forward to final this, the roundtable discussion with you as well. And now I would like to uh, to call Ms. Dr. Gyeonggu Shin. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, we will now see a, a video. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> on the <laughs> PowerPoint file.
Hello. Um, yes, I. Um, okay, we will now uh, see a, a video. Is that correct? Um, on learning sustainable lifestyles in the Japanese countryside, featuring uh, Mr. Jaibir Rai, Minister of Education of Bhutan. Over a year, they really gone down, they almost closed down the school, but now the children are coming up. So now what I like about them is they integrate and they integrate the parents, children, teachers and the schools very well. All societies are involved to raise the children and also management and leadership of the school is wonderful. So all these things really boil down. Um, to me that uh, at the end uh, a village is required to raise a child. And of course I cannot forget the young leadership here. Our king keeps on insisting that to be a strong nation we need a strong uh, youth. and. Uh, in order to make a strong youth, we need a strong and quality education. Uh, I see that education for sustainable development, in true essence, is the youth. Uh, myself included, the younger generation can take what was created before from the older generations and kind of organize it within ourselves, um, add our own flares, add the kind of the, the modern um, taste to it, and we can kind of create our own lifestyles here in Omori, in this small town of Omori. The most important thing to sustain anything, number one, I learned is the local leaders. leaders. Number two, how the young leaders really participate in reviving anything else. In other words, young leaders is also equally important. Number third, of course, it goes without saying that women must provide a basic facilities like roads, electricity, and also now these days, water, and of course, uh, internet. Fourth thing, business communities, participation in community development. What I learned here was that we don't need to keep building new and new things. It's that being able to maintain the tradition and the lifestyle here is what happiness is. We feel a lot of happiness for maintaining our history and our traditions here, but then we do include it in our daily lives. And I think that that's what everybody feels uh, very accomplished and that's why they feel fulfilled here. And so that's what we're doing and that's what we hope to continue doing into the future, into the next generation. And that's what I feel as though it's going to create the new meaning of what happiness is. And this is why Omori is a really good example of that new value and uh, that new meaning of happiness um, for not just simply Japan, but I think also for the whole entire world. Not only me, all, all of us thought that these villages uh, were left out after extracting, extracting all the silvers. But then after arriving here, meeting all the people, wonderful uh, people, wonderful communities, I learned that I'm going up. I'm not only looking at this village as an abundant silver mine, but I see gold and diamond mine that we have created here in Omari. No, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, video. I understand that uh, Dr. Gyungu Shin is here as well, that he will be able to speak. Um, uh, 
If my PowerPoint cannot be online over there, may I use it from this side? Okay. Yes. Would you allow me we to will. use my PowerPoint yes. file from here? Okay. Let me see uh, the hosts of the. Yes. Of yeah. The session. Would you give me okay. yeah, the host okay. function? Uh huh. Just yeah, one second, uh, please. Just one second. I think you have now the possibility. Mm -hmm. Can you see mine? Yes. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Maybe you can make it as a presentation opening. Okay, good. Yeah, that's good. Thank then. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my topic today is accelerating the local level action with UN education, science, and culture. If, uh, so that's, the, that's my topic today. Uh, Guangzhou has a special uh, kind of historical experience. So for example, in the 20th century of Korea, there were about eight major uprisings, and two took place in Guangzhou. So Guangzhou city is trying to promote its cultural heritage in, through education first. So all students are required to take courses about human rights, social welfare of their workers, general public, as well as government employees. In fact, city employees are all required to take courses on human rights as you see to the right side. But I want to stress that not all cities or regional governments, whether oppressors or oppressed, use the, their cultural heritage or historical heritage for the future. But Guangzhou is making the most of its historical heritage, including uh, science research function. So we produce quite a lot of books about, about our human rights movement or democracy movement, both Korean, English, and then many research papers as you see here. And then we also have UNESCO registered uh, May 18 archives, as you see here. So we have huge amount of research products at hand. In addition, we also use a lot of cultural products to promote human rights. As you see, in the past 40 years, uh, Korea produced 21 movies. One of the recent movies attracted 12 million audience. And then some dramas. One of the popular uh, drama attracted two thirds of Korean population when the drama was on TV. And then BTS is one of the most popular uh, like a K uh, performance groups, they also uh, sang my city or Guangzhou city about Guangzhou movement. Uh, one of the uh, novel about Guangzhou named Human Act, it uh, sold 400,000 copies after it was produced 2014. So nearly 10 no, 100,000 copies a year it was sold. So poems, and then we have many fine art products, but I cannot, the, all of these I confirmed, but I could not uh, count all the fine art products. But not all these cultural products are from Guangzhou. They are from Guangzhou, from the all nation of South Korea, and then from abroad as well. So uh, to promote human rights and SDGs, we use education, science, and culture. We know that these three 
should remain as education, science, and culture. But the greatest of these seems to be education. We use both uh, research function as well as uh, culture function to promote or education of our younger generation for human rights as well as SDGs. But I have to uh, confess that uh, we uh, do not successfully incorporate SDGs in our human rights education. But the annual World Human Rights Cities Forum we are having about 10 years ago from, uh, we are incorporating both human rights and SDGs. So in the future, through this education, I hope that the city of Gwangju can be more human rights friendly and then promoting more sustainable development goals in our future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shin, for your presentation. And now maybe you can uh, stop sharing your screen so we can continue. That's what I did. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. And now uh, we, I would like to call uh, Mrs. Elzbieta Volosinska Wisniewska. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I work for UNEP Great Warsaw Center. So we are an NGO uh, supporting implementation of the UN Environment Mission, particularly in Poland, but we cooperate with many other partners. And today I would like to give you a very short speech about our approach to integrated learning for smart cities. The next slide, please. Uh, we work within the urban science concept. So it means that we believe that cities and towns, they work as ecosystems. Um, as a whole, we know that ecosystems are mostly linked to nature, uh, but uh, cities and towns are also a kind of ecosystems that we need to take into account when we talk about sustainable development. We believe that science can help uh, to develop solutions uh, for urgent city challenges such as waste management or access to clean water. Uh, and to do that, scientists of the future, they would need specific skills and knowledge to take part in, in this process. Uh, that's why we, we uh, use so-called integrated learning in our activities. We cooperate with many municipalities in, in Poland, with many cities and towns, with mayors, and also people responsible for environmental protection or uh, spatial planning. And every time we talk about this, this integrated learning, it means that we want our young people, our students, uh, when they educate, when they learn, uh, we want them to work with everyday life situations. Uh, and we want this education to be based on inquiry-based learning. So we treat the city, the urban space, as a living laboratory where students can learn how um, science can help to create healthy cities. And what's the most important, also we explore an open schooling idea. It means that we connect students, teacher, parents, scientists, um, business community, and other partners together uh, to work for the better future. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I would like to, to show you one example of the projects that we implemented. We cooperated with the city of Warsaw and the city of Poznan. I'm sure you, some of you uh, know this, uh, these pictures. They come from a game called Minecraft. Uh, but we did something more. We created EcoCraft in cooperation with our Dutch partner, uh, Geodan. Uh, what is the difference? The difference is that in the traditional Minecraft, uh, young people build their own world uh, with 3D models, uh, with 3D cubics. Uh, in our case, in EcoCraft, they uh, have some basic models that we produced on the basis of real 3D uh, geodata. It means that all the streets and buildings, uh, all these gray buildings that you can see in the video, uh, they are there in the reality in the city. So when students go into the game, they work with real urban space. They know, they live in, 
they work in, they educate in, uh, and their task is to create a better future, the, the vision of better future of the city, uh, more greener, uh, maybe with some other sustainable solutions available. Uh, of course, we educate students, we help educators to get more knowledge about city challenges and possible solutions. Uh, then the students explore their city, they identify the most urgent issues, and they use EcoCraft to collaborate and to create eco-cities of their future. The next slide, please. Uh, we also have some experts working with students uh, so they can help young people uh, to find out more about solutions available. Uh, and we also involve citizens. So every time we do this kind of projects, uh, we ask citizens about their opinion. What do they want to uh, what do they want to have in their city? What do they think about ideas that students provide? Uh, and at the end of the day, we also have city council or the mayors involved. Uh, first of all, they get information about needs and expectations of the young generation and all the citizens. And on the other hand, they also get inspirations for the future. So under this link uh, given in the slide, you can download the ebook which was created from this project implemented in Warsaw and Poznan. Uh, and you can read more about solutions that students created and, of course, about the whole idea of using EcoCraft for this kind of activities. The next slide, please. We also use geoportals in our activities. So this one was created for another small Polish city when uh, the project uh, uh, was implemented and schools, young uh, students, school students, they ask their community Mm, what do you want to have in the future in your city? And the people could put their ideas into the map and they can mark the places that they want to uh, have in the future uh, or the places that they want to change. Or maybe they want it like in a the picture, they wanted to add so-called green bus stops. Uh, so we also use this kind of interactive tools, map applications, geoportals to communicate and it was particularly useful tool during COVID-19 uh, pandemia when people were not able to meet face to face, but they had to communicate online. The next slide, please. And uh, as a summary, I wanted to give you some two other links to the projects that we implement for now, a Pulkra project and urban science project. Under the first link, you will find uh, an explanation of how do we uh, include open schooling idea into our projects, how we combine students, teachers, scientists, and parents together to work for the better future. And Urban Science Project was mostly uh, focused on creating um, different learning materials. So this is great inspiration for teachers, uh, but also for, for other educators or for people who work in the, in the community, uh, in, uh, in the offices uh, with for example, educational curricula, and they are looking for different ideas on how to implement SDGs into their uh, education. And I just wanted to uh, to give you some hint that in, in this year, in 2029, 20, 2021, uh, uh, sorry, uh, UN Environment will announce the decade of ecosystem restoration. So this is the great, uh, this is the great um, beginnings is a great start uh, if we want to talk about cities as ecosystem because urban areas are mentioned as one of the ecosystems uh, which are important for our lives for for our uh, well-being uh, so we also we, we can use this decade of ecosystem mm -hmm. restoration to talk more about cities as ecosystem mm -hmm. and to think on how they can how we can help them to grow with our new approach in education. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Elspieta. And now uh, we move to the second part, which consists of uh, four questions, five questions. Uh, each speaker will have three minutes to address the question. And at the same time, the audience will be able to, to contribute and interact. For the interaction part, uh, we asked a question with Mentimeter to all of you. 
And, um, and also, well, the rest of the speakers uh, will have the opportunity to respond to the audience inputs for a period of three minutes. So here, the challenge is the time. So I appreciate if you can take a look at the uh, clock that is there. Um, so for the first three minutes, the first question is for Mrs. Soat Abderrahim. Uh, and the question is, how are communities using education to provide skills and knowledge leading to better opportunities and promoting inclusive prosperity? Mrs. Abdelrahim. Thank you very much. This is a highly important question. Having listened to the very high quality information provided by the various speakers, one can only note the importance of connection between local authorities and people who are in charge of education and teaching. It is crucial to have that communication, that connection, to uh, be able to guarantee uh, that uh, uh, we will uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. Also, it is important to ensure participation of local communities so that those communities can access skills and competences, uh, opening up uh, better opportunities. So, in other words, the, the question that, that you're putting has to do with the best environment, the most favorable environment for inclusive prosperity. And I think that we, uh, at the level of local authorities, should do our utmost to promote education opportunities and guarantee the same access to opportunities and to education for all to ensure access to skills uh, and competences. I think it is important today to develop everything that can lead to innovation, to encourage startups and to try to create that uh, symbiosis in terms of efforts between local authorities and the other stakeholders to ensure that we have real solutions to the problems uh, encountered by our cities today. And I think it is important to make good use of the UN decade that has started this year to um, move forward and to ensure that education is a tool, an instrument that enables us to uh, develop the best prosperity indicators and uh, that would include educational programs, curricula and everything that uh, we are trying to implement. And this should really uh, enable us to improve the quality of education, the quality of teaching uh, provided. We need to ensure that we can guarantee quality education and it is a responsibility of local authorities uh, to uh, implement this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I want to uh, clarify that it's not through Mentimeter, sorry. It's uh, through here, through the platform. So it would be uh, wonderful if you can also share your thoughts about these questions using uh, as well the chat options. Um, and let's see if any of the other speakers in three minutes would like to say a word about this, about this question. Anyone? Or comment on the interactions. Okay, so. Let's see, there's a panel. Aha, Dr. Shin. You can open your mic so we can listen to you. Uh, very nice. Uh, local authorities, 
Dr. Shin, for some reason, yeah, okay, thank you so much. For some reason, your, your audio is not working very well. So later on, when you are going to speak, maybe you can uh, try to, uh, to fix that. Oh, maybe this is okay. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so we can move on to the second question, if that is fine. Okay, good. Um, so I asked uh, Mr. Felipe de Sousa Costa to be prepared to, uh, ask, uh, to respond to this question. How are communities using education to impart skills and values for peace, diversity, and intercultural dialogue? Mr. de Sousa. Okay, so as you could see my presentation, we started from the institutional documents we had produced, like migrant and native peoples, and from training with teachers and from direct action with our students, with projects, classes, and actions that integrated abilities and competence with the SDGs. And for these, I think it is essential to consider the or the integral education of our students. So it can to face, of course, uh, the challenge of the 21st century. And for us, this integrates some actions and promote peace. We have a great diversity here and a really diverse public here. And for us, these actions help us to, to face this and to promote this. Thank you. There's actually a, a comment here in the platform. Uh, well, it, it's from Maria right there. It says that congrats to all presentations, amazing, inspiring. And uh, she says, she's so happy to see Sao Paulo City he has the experience in basic education curriculum with learning objectives aligned to SDGs presented today. This for sure an inspiration to the whole world. So that's a, a, a comment related to the work that Sao Paulo City as well is, is doing. Thank you so much. Okay, so this question is focusing on skills and values for peace and how uh, cities can, can uh, promote uh, uh, this through education. Is there a, any, uh, anyone from the other speakers who would like to, to refer to this question? Can values and skills be promoted at the city level, community level? Well, someone would like to, to refer to this? Okay, very good. Okay, we'll move forward maybe, to the question, to the third question. So this is for Dr. Gyeonggu uh, Shin. How are communities using education to ensure inclusive places where all people have equal access to services for sustainable livelihood and lifestyles? Uh, do I have three minutes again? Three minutes, yes. Uh, is, is the audio okay now? 
Now we can hear you. Yes. Good. Thank you very Thank much. You. I forgot to put it on before. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's good. Now, uh, in fact, uh, the education, as, as we continue to talk about, seems to be quite important to uh, change the concept of the people. But uh, the reason that education is important is, to, is because we can start to, to change the perception of the younger generation first. So educating primary school students, secondary school students when they are young, it is the most effective in changing the idea of the people for them to be more inclusive to the difference, like uh, immigrants, refugees, or vulnerable people. So in that regard, I really believe that educating younger generation seems to be the most important to change the idea and then for equal access to services, then younger people should be educated to, to make the most of the services available on their lives as well. Then the older generation are not good at using or utilizing the services, but the, their children can help their parents as well. So in that regard, I really believe that younger people's education is the most important. Another one is we have to mobilize civil societies. The general public are not good at uh, approaching the services, but when they are mediated by groups, whether it is their own groups or civil society groups, they are ready to access the services and then work with different people. So just the two, one, younger generation education, another, civil society mobilization. That's what I want to promote. Okay, very good. So, yeah. <laughs> The world, the world today. Uh, yeah, Elspieth, I was thinking about you, Elspieth, because your talk, your talk yeah. was referring too much on this. I'm like, I hope <laughs> she wants to refer to this question. Go yes, ahead. thank you very much. I wanted to refer because uh, the first thing that came up to my mind was that in this kind of projects, uh, we also use uh, role playing as a tool. Uh, for education. So uh, I fully agree with the previous speaker that uh, education of young generation is the most important and education can be treated as a safe environment to test how it's uh, going to be if you need to access some services or, or um, your neighborhood. For example, if you are a disabled person, uh, students can test uh, what are the barriers uh, and what should be modified to make our lives easier and also to, to, to make lives easier for people who are uh, in need, who are disabled or, or people who are not familiar with the language or whatever. Uh, so um, this, this kind of role playing is a really nice, really important tool that can help uh, young students to think about their uh, city, their towns as a place uh, for all people, a very inclusive place. Thank you so much, both of you, for addressing this uh, question. Um, I guess we can now uh, move on to the next question, if it's fine with all of you. And for this one, I would like to ask uh, all the uh, panelists of today to pay attention and maybe uh, you can all refer, maybe all or at least uh, two of you <laughs> refer to this uh, question. And it says, how are communities using education to contribute to protecting our planet at local level? So how are cities? Ah, okay, Elspieta, we can... Continue yeah. with you. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> yes, you so much. Yeah, we talk about the planet. So the planet is is the the key word for uh, the whole uh, of our activities in Union Great Warsaw because we we act for the planet uh, actually. And when we cooperate with the municipalities, with the cities, with towns, we do everything that we can 
uh, to put their attention on the state of our environment. And all the projects that we implement, they have this environmental part, an environmental issue. And to be honest, as in SDGs as a whole, there are very specific SDGs which are related to environment. But we believe that in every single SDG, there is the part, this is, there is this environmental part. Uh, because uh, if the state of the environment is good, uh, we are healthy, we are happy, and, and we can we can live in a sustainable way. So um, so that, that's why we believe that uh, when we talk about uh, local level, uh, this environmental part should be included in all the activities. Uh, of course, we have so-called environmental education. Uh, but um, to be honest, sometimes it, 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 is, it is treated in, in a very basic level, for example, you know, how to sort waste or how to spur the water, and that's it. Uh, but of course, it is, this is important, this is very important. But when we talk about the planet, we need to change our way of thinking. Uh, we need to educate young generation um, in a way that they don't think in the same way that we did. Because if they do, the, we, we cannot implement any change. Uh, they need to find their own way uh, of taking care of the planet. Uh, and that's why we want them to be creative, to be innovative. And we just give them the floor to think about new ideas, sometimes very creative. <laughs> uh, but but they, I, we believe that they have this power to find some good new solutions for uh, for the challenges that we still have. Excellent. Okay, I see uh, Mrs. Abderrahim, would you like to refer to this question? And how in Tunis can uh, the city contribute to protect the environment? Indeed, it is very important. We need to ensure that from the beginning we have young people on board, uh, pupils and students uh, in the curricula. We collaborated with civil society uh, in terms of organic waste and how to optimize that waste. We also uh, brought schools on board in this initiative and we launched uh, the concept of uh, uh, environmental balance. So we launched uh, small-scale projects, uh, uh, the level of children to help them uh, become aware of these issues and the issue of balance in the environment and how we preserve the environment uh, while uh, being close to nature, how to be aware of uh, the uh, emission of toxic gases into the atmosphere. If you look at the buildings around you, if you look at cars and climate changes as they are are uh, felt uh, on a daily basis and the need to bring down emissions and to uh, uh, broaden uh, green spaces. So through uh, uh, teaching materials, we can bring these issues down to the daily experience of children and to make the environment an attractive issue that will attract young people and children and make them aware of the need to achieve this environmental balance that, that we aspire to. So we've listened very carefully to the examples given by our colleagues at this meeting. and. This is the benefit uh, that we can uh, uh, draw from this conference, so we can draw inspiration uh, thanks to this exchange of very diverse experiences within the uh, many uh, uh, cities and, and municipalities because they can play a very important role. They can be even more effective, more integrating and uh, closer to these issues and they can also intervene in the framework of school curricula by providing these initiatives to children and young people. The municipalities can participate in uh, developing programs or initiatives that uh, uh, could, for instance, include uh, uh, sustainable development indicators that can then be used by other institutions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Very much. Excellent. Excellent. I love that uh, what you're saying about learning the uh, about the um, balance in 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 nature. So that's wonderful that you're doing that. Uh, okay. I don't know if someone else wanted to mention something. Uh, okay. So we can move on. Do Dr. Shin, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, yes. Please, okay. Please, uh, good. I, I agree really uh, uh, with like a uh, mayor of the Rhyme about the school curriculum. I think school curriculum seems to be the most important device to promote environmental protection and then educate the people to protect the planet. The first thing that then hope we can, the, 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 city, the city government can produce some system giving benefit to those who protect the climate. It's like a city ordinance seems to be quite effective as well. Protecting, like uh, recycling, protecting in that regard. The city ordinance can be very effective. And then probably we can promote neighborhood activities for them to participate, to get friendly while protecting the planet. That kind of like a game, as Alicia mentioned, the, 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 somehow uh, the, the, the mentioned that we talked about some like a networking among neighborhood people while working for the environment. That seems to be okay, desirable in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, there is a, a, a comment also uh, from Jürgen Forkel Schubert. Uh, it says, the question is, if the communities use education at all, mostly eco-specialists do it on their own without including education sometimes. So the question is how to connect both. I think uh, that's... Uh, challenge, uh, Jorgen, of course, and that's one of the things that we want to address in this session, but also in this um, area of the Education for Sustainable Development 2030, how to connect both. And that's the, thank you for reminded, remind us that that's uh, the key challenge on this. Uh, okay, so maybe we can move to the last question, uh -huh. and this question, uh, Ms. Elzbieta Wolosinska, she's going to uh, address this and says, how are communities creating partnership to promote lifelong education for sustainable development? And I remind uh, the attendees who are here today, you can write your comments or your questions in the chat or Q&A uh, section. Oh part here. Thank you, Elsvieta. Uh, thank you very much. I think that um, I can answer to this question, also to the question uh, from the chat, because I believe that there is uh, not simple, but, uh, but it's a good answer, uh, open schooling idea, open schooling concept. We believe that um, schools are not only the places where students learn. I mean, these are not only the places where students come at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they leave the building at 1, 2, 3 o'clock, and, and that's it. Schools, can, schools have really great potential to become uh, local community centers, to become places where people um, come to learn, not only when they are young, not only when they come because they have to, uh, but they come because they want to. So uh, schools can become the places where young people and older people, experts and non-experts, they come together to discuss um, the challenges of their local community. And um, so in this, in this way, they build partnerships on the local level and they promote this lifelong learning education because young people can learn from older people. Uh, who sometimes have really amazing and inspiring stories behind, and uh, they can they can work together to create something more. Um, they can work collaborate with teachers, with scientists, with experts who join them, uh, who who are the part of this growing community. So uh, schools 
as I mentioned, schools have a great potential to become this kind of local community centers. But and some, sometimes we need to change the way of thinking about schools because this official educational system really often is put somewhere um, on, on, on one side of, of the uh, discussion about education. And on the other side, we have this lifelong learning education. Uh, I believe that they should be combined. If, if we have this official system, official educational system, uh, well, let's, let's use it, let's build on it. And uh, we can really show the communities and, and show people that schools are not only the buildings uh, that young people go to, schools can really become communities themselves and they can promote um, this, this education for sustainable development. At least we try to do it in, in our projects. And if you want to learn more, I invite you to uh, the Pulchra project website, uh, which is, I think, the best idea. Uh, and it's implemented in, in several European cities. So I believe you would be able to see really great examples. Thank you. Wonderful. And I think it was great uh, synchronicity, I think, that the question from the audience was so related to, to this question um, that we had. And um, okay, um, is anyone else uh, in the on the panelist? I don't know if okay, Dr. Sheen, and maybe uh, as well later, uh, uh, Mr. Felipe de Sousa, if you want to come later, and. <laughs> Ms. Mrs. Abderrahim as well, but Dr. Shin, if you want to refer yeah. to this. I, I found that uh, the, for the lifelong education, that since the question is lifelong education, the problem for the older generation, after they retire, they do nothing. They kill their life. So we have to mobilize them to get involved with the planet protection. To do that, we have to give benefit again. I talked about benefit a while ago. So without benefit, we are human beings. So we are not highly motivated without benefit. So we should either giving, give some benefit or, or like a game or joy, enjoyment, whatever it is, uh, networking opportunities or some prizes. I do not think the benefit should be big enough. The benefit should be very small for fun for them to get engaged. So hope we can combine lifelong education for the older generation with some benefit combined for them to be motivated to participate. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I see that there is in the floor um, a question as well um, for Madame Mayor. It says climate change does not have borders. Air pollution, resource degradation could affect a municipality who is advanced in sustainable de development if its neighboring city is not advanced. So my question is whether the city of Tunis has collaborated or exchanged with other cities and communities near Tunis to jointly establish education for sustainable development, good environmental practices, etc. Uh, so, yeah. Madam Mayor, if you want to refer to this, have you been able or have the city of Tunis been able to collaborate in this sense with other cities nearby? Yes, indeed. All experience is useful. It allows us to learn and to move forward. So we have established a number of partnerships with cities throughout the world. And we have an experimental initiative with Paris, the School of Cleaning for Recycling Some Forms of Waste. This is a school that brings together young people who wish to commit to a brighter future for the environment and this is seen in centers for farming or organic waste that I mentioned earlier. 
And it teaches them to be proactive and to fight for uh, agricultural balance. There are other projects, for example, how to make the city cleaner. And this allows us to use education and data as well as the culture that we have available to harness it to help the environment. How do we reduce toxic gas emissions? And how can we ensure that we can produce uh, waste that is not necessarily harmful for the environment? How do we reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions? How do we renew the air? How do we ensure that we use renewable energy? We have partnerships with other cities that cover all of these topics. We exchange experiences and the international community is a platform that brings together all of these experiences so that we can create a sustainable and clean environment. And this applies at local level, of course. Okay. If we don't adopt a sustainable approach, then we can suffer harmful consequences. And this is why we should establish precise indicators on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the time is now running out. And so thank you all for your wonderful contributions for being present today. I just would like to highlight uh, just a few points. Um, the importance, as uh, uh, Madame Mayor mentioned, the importance of promoting democratic progress in relation to education for sustainable development and preserve traditions and culture. Also, we learned from Felipe de Sousa and the um, city of Sao Paulo, how important is that a city um, engages with the education processes, generating documents, materials, guidelines for teachers, also uh, address the city curriculum al aligned with the SDGs. So that was wonderful to, to, to hear and to learn from uh, other cities can learn from Sao Paulo as well. Um, and Dr. Sheen, uh, he also uh, highlighted the importance of bringing the uh, human rights education into uh, ESG, uh, connect them very, uh, very well using, using science and culture and how culture with movies, with music, etc., can advance uh, can advance these uh, these aspirations. And with Mrs. Elzbieta Wolsinska, we. We learned a very interesting app, uh, EcoCraft, and how an NGO can get uh, as well involved with uh, cities and with uh, schools, and how the schools can become these centers of thoughts, these centers of uh, as, as well innovation. And and with this EcoCraft, at least I I was I'm gonna try to learn more about it because it allowed. Uh, to use the um, uh, daily activities and the, and the local context to learn and as a laboratory to collaborate as well with other scientists and other experts, with students. So what a wonderful way to promote partnerships at the local level. So it is now time to close this session. Uh, I wish you all a very fruitful conference as well. Uh, thank you again for your participation. It has been wonderful and very enriching uh, for all of us. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the continuation of this wonderful international experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.